I could not believe what I was seeing. I could have filled the back of his head with 556, which is an absolute joke. Well, it's not an ape, because if the Sasquatch was an ape, we would already have one. What are these elusive hominids that stalk the wilderness? Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevning. Welcome to the mystery. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Creek Devil. We have a special guest today. Tom, would you like to introduce our guest? Yes, I would. Forrest, thank you for joining us today and welcome aboard Creek Devil. Um, you and I talked the other day and it was it was just riveting. I mean, I, I don't even know if we're going to get it all in in an hour, but if we could start when you were a child and even your dad knew or your grandfather, I think it was, who knew about these things. So start from there and just fill us in. What's going on? Well, when I was a child, I was never allowed out of the house there on the ranch uh, after dark because my grandfather always said uh, he was afraid of the woolly boogers. And, of course, he told me about the story uh, that I related to you about the girl in Marble Falls, Texas. I live in Burnett, which is about 20 miles from uh, Marble Falls. And um, there was a young lady that back in the early, and I don't remember to be honest with you whether it was the early 1900s or late 1800s, but it had been related to him by his uh, father about the girl that was actually, um, she was abducted by, by one. They called him the hairy man. Um, and, of course, there's two different stories. I mean, she was actually found alive. And uh, if I remember correctly, I think it was over by Blanco, which is uh, a good ways away. And um, that uh, they did say that uh, some of the men had killed it in a cave, which there are lots of caves in this area. And um, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But uh, And then there's other stories that says that the, they never saw it again so um who knows what the real story is you know it's been a long time <laughs> no i understand but, uh, absolutely so yeah. but what i found interesting is the fact that um this is sort of ingrained in the local knowledge where you grew up as a kid yes yes it is yeah and in fact um, I think I told you right now what is really strange is that everybody up and down my road has been getting these metal um, Bigfoot signs and putting them on their, their property. Uh, I found several of them up and down uh, uh, 30, FM 3509 out here in, in Burnett. So, um, and they're selling them in town. <laughs> Have you had a chance to talk to any of your neighbors and just, you know, find out uh, maybe casually – um, hey, neat sign, you know, what, what, what's the deal behind that? Or, Well, I had talked to uh, one of my neighbors, but he's since passed away, but he had had, uh, he thought it was just prowlers on his property. And uh, because we have had problems with uh, squatters coming in on our property and stuff like that. Now, um, as I related to you, uh, it's been about, oh gosh, um, I would say seven years ago, I had walked out one morning to feed my horses and I saw all these limbs hanging out of my tr uh, cedar trees. And I think I explained to you that my grandfather had uh, trimmed all these cedar trees up so that they would look like real trees rather than just big giant bushes. And some of them have got trunks that are probably three feet around. They're huge. And um, so I'm looking up and I get, I'm, I'm like, uh, these limbs are hanging down from as high up as 20 feet and they're like twisted, turned around and around and around. And I'm like, how in the devil did those get like that? I just couldn't figure it out. And my friend that was with me, he kept telling me, all oh, the horses are doing, I'm doing that. And I'm like, uh, that is impossible unless my, you know, my horses couldn't even standing on their hind legs, couldn't reach those limbs. And what are they going to do? Do a twirly dance out there to get those limbs to look like that. And I mean, we, 
this went on actually for about two weeks. I kept finding limbs like that. And some of them had actually been jerked out of the trees and were laying on the ground all twisted up. And then uh, about two mornings later, I had actually gone out there and my feed trailer had been shoved over like three feet and the doors had been ripped off of it. And something had gone in there and got into my my feed bags and um, had torn open the the feed bags and stuff themselves. And, of course, my daughters kept saying, oh, Mom, it's just raccoons. So I said, well, those have to be the biggest darn raccoons I ever saw to, to accomplish that. But um, the strange thing about it was that a couple of nights later, I actually started, every time I would leave, I would um, um, go and drive around my um, barn. And I happened to catch something on a knoll and I saw eyes shine up there and I thought, well, that's got to be the <laughs> widest eyes up there for, you know, I, I couldn't, couldn't figure out what it was because it was just really, really bright eye shine and they were really wide apart. And the next day, um, my girlfriend's uh, son came over to clean the stalls and he was listening to him and he wandered up there. And he was like, Miss Kay, you need to come up here and look at this. You need to come up here and look at this. And that's when Sandra and I wandered up there. And lo and behold, um, there were footprints in the, the dirt up there. And one was about the si- uh, size of my foot. And then the other one was probably a good twice the size of my foot. And it was right underneath a cedar tree that kind of hung down. And evidently, um, I guess... A couple of them had been sitting up there um, and watching me at the barn and at the cabin. And so I must have been a good source of entertainment for them. (laughs) Well, you know, and and, uh, I like the idea that he thought it was uh, raccoons. And I just commenting to Will, you know, everything's bigger in Texas. I got an uncle from Texas, (laughs) including the raccoons, you know, eight, nine hundred pound raccoons, right? Right. Yeah. I actually have a pet raccoon and, and she's pretty big, but she never she'd never be able to push over a feed trailer. <laughs> yeah. And and you know, that's it's one of those things, the the feed trailer um is it kind of a recurring theme. It's a it's a repeating pattern. We've heard that in the past. These things come in and, and that's what they're interested in is food. Uh and especially the yeah. you know, people that hang deer or meat in a you know in a in a smokehouse and feed trailers and all that kind of stuff well we fixed the doors on the feed trailer and then it happened again and i just said you know forget it we're not putting any more feed in here because it's obviously not going to work so that's when we started storing it in the barn and then locking the barn up so um anyway (laughs) that's the way it is now but um no, I will. I will relate, and I didn't get a chance to tell you about this before, but to, about the uh, my air conditioner. Um, it. Uh, I actually woke up one morning at two o'clock in the morning because I, I had told you that my house had burned down, and um, <clears throat> I had gotten me a cabin to move out there, and I was living in that, and I had a window unit in the cabin. And I woke up one morning at two o'clock and my cats were just going, were growling and hissing and making the god awfulness noise. And um, my air conditioner is moving back and forth in the window. And I thought, oh my gosh, one of the darn horses is up there using it as a scratching post. And so I had uh, looked out the window. And when I looked out the window, of course, the, the other funny thing was that the cats, uh, this, this cabin has a two story um, in it and the cats all disappeared upstairs. They were like, Nope, we're out of here. <clears throat> and um, so anyway, I looked out the window and I'm telling you, it was nothing but solid black. And I was like, well, that's just bizarre because I actually have a, on the other side of the cabin, I have a uh, pole light and that light actually sheds light on to the other side of the cabin And my F-350, Ford F-350, was parked just uh, right outside there by the cabin. And I couldn't even see that. And I thought, well, okay, this is just a little bit bizarre. 
And then after I started waking up a little bit and starting focusing, I'm like looking at this and I'm like going, oh, my God, wait a minute. This is I see uh, I see chest. uh, I see skin. And that's when it kind of stepped back. It was actually (laughs) a Bigfoot. And he had a hold of my air conditioner unit, and I don't know whether he was trying to take it out of there or whether he was just messing with it or what he was, but I started screaming. I actually grabbed my shotgun, and I started screaming at him, and I was beating on the wall with the shotgun, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to go out there and fire the shotgun. And then I got to thinking, you know, (laughs) that may be exactly what he was hoping that I would do is walk out of the, the cabin. And so I did not do that, and I just kept beating on the the wall of the cabin. And he finally turned, and when he walked away, and you're going to laugh because my girlfriends all laughed at me when I said this. I said, you know, I never did get a really good look at – I didn't get any really good look at his face. I did see his shoulder and his uh, back when he turned, and he was black. And from what I could tell, he was solid black. But I said when he was walking away, he was a good, his shoulders were good uh, shoulders and head above the top of my F-350 pickup truck. And I said, but I, when he was walking away, I said, I was focused on his butt. Now, I know that sounds like it's really bizarre, but he had the biggest glutes I have ever in my life seen on anybody. And everybody all laughed at me, you know, oh, girl, yeah, yeah, we're looking at his uh, behind. And I said, well, that was just <laughs> what I saw. And I said, he had the biggest uh, butt muscles I have ever in my life seen on anything. And his shoulders were wide too. They had to have been ever bit of at least four and a half feet across the, the, across his back. And um, I don't know where he went to, but I know that uh, they sit out and howl and scream out there in the back of the property, but uh, they usually come through. What I figured out is they come through in the fall. And right now, here just uh, uh, about, what was it, about uh, two weeks ago that I told you uh, that uh, I was, uh, it was actually a warm night and I had the window open and you could hear them back there in the back screaming and hooting and carrying on. So, yeah. <laughs> How far away they're are they when they're, when they're screaming and hooting and stuff? Well, actually, they, they sounded like they were in the back of my property. And um, I would say it was probably a good uh, four to 500 yards back there. So, but there have been times that they've actually come up close in and I could hear them jabbering out there. And I I actually discussed it with a friend of mine who is a Bigfoot researcher. And, um, that I said, you know what it reminds me of their language, if you want to call it a language, but whatever they're, they're doing it reminds me, have you ever heard the Kalahari Bushman talk? Clips yes, talk yes, 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 those, those, those movies, said, yeah. Ex- yes, I said that was exactly what I, it reminded me of. I, I literally sat at my bedroom window listening to these, and I told my daughter the next day, I said, I thought I was in one of my anthropology movies <laughs> listening to the Kalahari Bushman. I said, because you hear these pops and uh, tongue clicks and uh, whistles. And I said, that's what it sounds like. And you know what? They are, uh, uh, most people think that they actually speak the original uh, human language. So, you know, that's kind of interesting. Um, and Will's talked about a lot of times people will confuse uh, wood knocks. And, and the reality is these things are doing very, very powerful uh, tongue pops. Tongue pops. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it, I just and, think it's interesting that you had heard all this different type of chitter chatter and uh, and that's what they're doing is whistles and tongue pops. Well, I had, I had an interesting occurrence here two nights ago um, that since I spoke to you that um, I uh, usually, I save my scraps, my eggshells and my peelings, potato peelings and tomato peelings and stuff like that and put them in a bowl. And then I uh, usually take them out and throw them at the edge of the woods for my raccoons and possums and such. And it was after dark that I did it. And I usually don't go out there after dark, but I thought, well, I can see from the nightlight really well, so I'll just do that. So um, I, I walked out there and uh, threw that out. And as I was walking back, I looked in the, the bowl. It was a plastic bowl. And 
I still had some onion peelings in there. And I thought, well, I need to get rid of these things. So as I'm walking back up to the house, I, uh, my, I have pipe fencing and I just hit the bowl on this pipe. And I thought to myself, that just, I just sounded like I made a wood knock because this plastic bowl on this metal pipe, that's what it sounded like. And, um, I walked on in the house and I had put something in the microwave. I grabbed that and uh, grabbed me a fork and went and sat in my, my chair. And about that time, I, I mean, I just had no more sat down in the chair than I hear this bang, bang, bang. And they had actually walked up and hit the back of my cat house. I have, you know, you knew, I told you I do uh, work with uh, cats and stuff. Yeah, rescue. And, yeah, right. Yeah, uh-huh. And I had, I had put the cats up in their cat house, and uh, here this thing had walked up and hit the back of that cat house. And I was like, that's the only thing I could figure that did it, because it wasn't like there was anything else that could have done that. I can imagine one of my poor cats were uh, thinking being in there, but just bigger than anything, there was bang, bang, bang. And I had a, when I had gone through, I hit that bowl three times, too, and I thought, Okay, I just made some sort of communication. <laughs> I don't even know what I did, you know. So, he was almost like a retaliation, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know. Have you ever had any and, problems and with with? Um, I apologize. I didn't mean to cut you off. I just had a question. You know, you do rescue cats, and you have a lot of livestock. Have you ever had any problems with any of the animals on your property, uh, either being, uh, you know, missing or anything like that? You know, I have never had anything happen to any of my horses. Um, now, I did have one year, and that was right before that. That was the same year that I was seeing all the uh, the cedar limbs twisted in the cedar trees. I had twelve cats that disappeared, and of course, I blamed it on coyotes. But uh, you know, and I didn't even understand what cedar twists were i actually had uh listened to another program and heard them talking about these tree twists and such as that and that's when it suddenly dawned on me oh my gosh and then of course then you know a few days later we see the the footprints and stuff it started occurring to me uh you know i have i have an issue here (laughs) so yeah yeah so no uh no conclusive uh information but it sure you know kind of looks that way doesn't it well yeah and and in fact uh uh we did have one cat here back uh last fall that disappeared but it was just one and um of course my uh researcher friend he says gosh Kay, i hope they're not back bothering your cats but i have not had any disappear since then that was the only time and something obviously had an issue with what I was doing or not doing on my property to have gone through and, you know, done all those tree twists out there. So, but, uh, um, uh, anyway, uh, that's uh, the only other uh, incident that I had here at the house was, uh, one morning when I had, uh, the window, um, and I was sitting in my chair reading and I have a Belgian Malinois and I have to keep her kenneled at night because she has a tendency to get into stuff and, chew on stuff so i have her kennel right next to the window and um i heard the god awfulest growl and it was i mean it was enough that i could actually it was like i felt that growl and my dog is an 82 pound dog and uh, she's not afraid of anything she sat up in her kennel and she started barking and my other dog i have a black uh german shepherd and he was outside in his kennel he had been barking but that's not unusual he barks at raccoons at possums and everything else so i hadn't really thought too much about it but all of a sudden i heard this horrible growl at my screen window and my belgian malinois she set up lagatha sat up and she literally looked out that window and she started barking and growling and everything and it growled again and i'm here to tell you that that dog literally melted into the bottom of her kennel and she just kept she laid down in the bottom of her kennel and she just kept looking at that window. And I was like, Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I didn't even get out of my chair to go over there, but that was the God awfulest growl I had ever in my life heard. And, and um, uh, you know, 
it wasn't a big cat or anything like that. And, um, you know, I, I almost forgot about the, the black animal. I forgot to tell you about the black animal that, uh, I, when I was looking for a cat, remember that, that was, that walked across the road. And I know that several neighbors saw that too. And that was just about, uh, three weeks before I heard the growl. So there are. Tell me, yeah, back. describe that a little bit. You, yeah. you, we talked well, about it. I had, I had, <clears throat> yeah, I had jumped in my car. Uh, I work overnight and uh, now, and um, so I'm a day sleeper. So I was actually still in my jammies and I just jumped in my car and I was like looking for this cat. I had called and called and called and she hadn't come in. And sometimes she would wander over to my neighbor's house. And so I actually drove over there. Uh, to his house, and he's just about 200 yards up the road. And uh, so I drove over there, pulled in his driveway, and I had just rolled my window down, and I was calling for the cat. And I didn't see her anywhere. And um, as I was getting ready to back out, this other car passed me, so I had to stop. And then, lo and behold, here comes another one. And I just happened to look down the, the road, because they had stopped. Those two cars had stopped. And I, I thought, what is that going across the road? And I, my first thought was, well, that's a black bear. What in the world do we have? You know, black bears do come into Central Texas sometimes, but they're more predominantly found in East Texas. And our black bears are like 150-pound bears, you know, if that, if that. They're not big bears at all. And having lived in Alaska, trust me, I know what a big black bear looks like. And this looked like a big, big black bear when I first looked at it. But then I got to looking at it and I thought, oh, my God, that's not a black bear because the head placement was was all wrong. And the the leg length was all wrong. And these two cars were actually stopped. And it was just right at twilight where you almost need lights, but you don't you don't need lights. And these two cars were stopped. And then I had another car come. Uh, the, there was another car coming the other way and they had stopped. And then uh, I was actually going to pull out and then here comes another car and I couldn't, I didn't pull out and I just sat there and watched it. And it actually walked across the road, went through the ditch and then went into a pasture. Well, the car that was coming the other way actually turned its, uh, turned its, uh, he actually turned his car and then focused his lights out into the pasture so that they could, he could watch it. And the other cars just sat there. So I know that there was at least four vehicles besides myself that had seen that. And to my knowledge, the sheriff's department said that nobody had ever reported anything. And that was, it wasn't a bear. I I have seen lots of bears. Having lived in Alaska for 17 years, uh, trust me, I have seen lots of bears. The head placement was all wrong on the shoulders and the legs were way too long. And I know that there's probably, you know, at least four other people, if not more, that were probably just freaked out about the whole situation. And, and, and I'm sure people are afraid to report it because they think they're in that case. Yeah, we uh, we had a gal we talked to about two and a half years ago who saw one crossing a road like that and kind of the same thing. I, I don't remember if she thought it was a bear or I think that's what she thought it was. And then it stood up on its hind legs and walked and and that's what made her reach out and get a hold of us. So, and my neighbor, same thing. He he was elk hunting. He's ran into these things, and then um, he said, uh, you know, about hundred yards down the road, he saw one crossing the road, and and, and he thought he had no idea they they walk on all fours sometimes. And him and his yeah. friend are looking at this, and he goes, "That is the ugliest elk I've ever seen in my life." <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> well i'll tell you what i'll tell you about my first sighting that i ever had we were actually and i told you i lived in alaska for 17 years but uh my daughter and i were hauling some horses back up um to alaska and um i had uh, come through um oh, it was just north of coeur d'alene we had come through there and i because i had dropped a horse off south of Coeur d'Alene and then we went on up that away and um I had um <laughs> I was just driving along happily you know driving along and then all of a sudden this thing just 
strolled right out of the, and I don't know what it was because I was like, I was grabbing gears and breaking and everything else. And my daughter <laughs> nearly rolled off into the back floorboard. And I'm like, I was yelling at her to sit up, sit up. Oh my God, there's a big foot here. There's a big foot here. And the thing just strolled right out of the woods and strolled right across in front of me. And then went, just strolled right into the, like he had no care in the world. And that he just nearly got plastered by a big truck and horse trader. <laughs> and I just was like, why in the world would they just step out right in front of you? <laughs> and this was right at sunset. So, uh, you know. It it was just I just thought it was rather bizarre behavior. <laughs> so yeah, I have no idea. Um, Will you've talked about John Green said it's seventy percent of all Bigfoot sightings are red side and and sunset. You know, twilight is when when people see them the most. Yeah, it's usually right around plus or minus an hour of sunset. And the same holds true with sunrise, but most often you know in the evening and then uh, on or near roads. Well, it's almost like they have a death wish. I mean, just stepping out in front of vehicles, because I've heard that over and over uh, on your show, too, that they do that all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have no idea what what the deal is. Uh, I don't know that any have been hit so far, but um, if they have, you know, maybe they have. Who knows? I can't imagine that uh, the vehicle is going to, you know, uh, do well either in that encounter. Yeah, I've, I've heard of few occurrences where people have hit them, but uh, it's strange that law enforcement sure doesn't uh, uh, seem to talk about it too much. Not if they want to keep their jobs anyway. Right, right, yeah. No, we had a, uh, we had a guy that um, here in Oregon, and he saw uh, some guy uh, in front of him in a truck hit an elk and then just kept on going. And he thought that, you know, the elk was laying in the road. And he went by and he said, it wasn't just a few minutes. He said, he turned around and said, I, I, I got to take care of this. I can't let that elk suffer like that. So he turned around. He's going to go back and, you know, shoot it. <clears throat> and he gets back to where this elk with, you know, obviously it had broken legs, had been in the road. There's no elk. No blood trail, no hoof prints, nothing. It just vanished into the forest. Oh, my. And <clears throat> so he thinks, you know, what it was is one of these things came along, picked it up, and had a meal. Yeah. Yeah, free meal. <laughs> so, well, the only other uh, incident that I ever had occur in my life uh, was when I, I explained to you my husband was uh, was Air Force and so we were stationed in Alaska and then um, then we were moved to North Carolina and um, it was it was during the fall and our neighbors down the way about a quarter of a mile away from us they had uh, coon hounds and. Uh, they had gone someplace for the weekend and had asked us if we wouldn't mind watching their coon hounds. And they had uh, some cats and the cat's food was outside of a shed. But then there was a cat door so that the cats could go in the shed to get out of the weather. And then the coon hounds uh, had their dog houses and they were behind a chain link fence down there. And so we fed them and uh, put food and everything out for them. And we were getting actually getting ready to go to bed. It was about... Uh, 8 30 9 o'clock and um, my husband heard the coon hounds going off and you know how they can bay and make a, a lot of racket so he thought maybe it was best to get his rifle and go down there and see if maybe somebody was trying to break in their house or something so he walked down there and he was gone a long time and in the meantime I was trying to round up my cats and get them in the house uh, because I had one cat that I had she, uh, mom Susie wasn't coming in so um, I uh, had gone outside and uh, was walking along, I knew, knew there was one place that she used to go into the, the woods all the time and, and sit in there 
And I walked back there with a can of food trying to uh, see if I could entice her out. And I kept calling for her and calling for her and calling for her. And I was walking all up and down our wood line. And the next thing I hear is three gunshots go off. And I thought, oh, my, this is not a good sign. And then here comes my husband. And he had walked, walked down there. And he was actually running back to the house. And um, he was standing at our back door. And uh, he was yelling, get in the house now, get in the house now. And I'm like, what is his problem? And not knowing that anything had gone on down there. But, uh, you know, obviously something had because he fired three shots. And so he comes finally comes running out there in the pasture with me. And uh, he actually had another rifle with him and he tossed it to me. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this? And he said, First off, you're going to get back to the house with me. He literally had grabbed me by the scruff of my collar and turned me around. And just as he did that, um, there was a primate hoot. And I think I told you I have to decrease in anthropology. So I know what primates sound like. And there was a primate hoot that came right out of the woods. And it was not very far into the woods from me. And I was like, what? I mean, we literally both turned around at the same time and looked into the woods. And he, he just grabbed me again and he said, get in the house now. And so by the time we get back to the house and he gets me shuttled in and everything, he then proceeds to tell me what he had seen down at the neighbor's house. Evidently, when he walked down there, there was something bent over the cat food pan. And he thought it was a bear. So that's why he fired. He said, I just fired three shots up in the air and just wanted to scare it off, run it off. And it was their property bordered a swamp. And um, then the creek that fed into that swamp actually runs, uh, ran and bordered our uh, little farm there. And um, I went around the back part of our property and right where I had been standing, I was on the lip of the edge of the, the creek that came around from literally from these people's place. And um, so he, when he fired the three shots in the air, this thing had stood up. He thought it was a bear. And when it stood up, he suddenly realized it was not a bear. And, um, he said it just turned and ran off into the, the swamp area there. And that's when he literally ran back from their house. And like I said, they were about a quarter of a mile from our house and back to the house and then was uh, rounding me up. So uh, he never forgot that. And he used to tell everybody about it and told the guys that on um, base and everything else. And they all like poo pooed him and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You saw Bigfoot. You saw Bigfoot. He's like, yes, I did. <laughs> I saw Bigfoot. He said, and he, he, if he was alive today, he'd tell you the whole story because it literally, it scared him to death. He was shaking and I had never seen him scared of anything. So, um, but uh, yeah, that was a <laughs> hair raising ordeal. Yeah. And that was in North Carolina. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Right okay. outside of Goldsboro. Right outside of Goldsboro. Yeah, no, no. That's we get a lot of um reports out of uh, both North and South Carolina. So yeah, very interesting. <coughs> so getting back to the ranch that you're at, uh you've you've you know, you got the tree breaks, you've you've had the encounters, you've you have all this stuff. I mean, there's just no way your neighbors don't aren't also having some of these experiences. Have you heard anything at all from anybody that, you know, you're not the only one with this problem? Well, the only neighbors that I really talk to um, are off to my west side. And uh, before the gentleman over there passed away, he had, uh, he had, he was being bothered by uh, what he thought were prowlers. And uh, like I said, you know, I explained to you, we do have uh, squatters that come in and we've had to run off the ranches and stuff out there. And um, um, my my neighbor did say that there was uh, that uh, her son had uh, had seen something, but he didn't know what it was. It was just big and dark. And um, 
because I was telling her, you know, I, he could, I had told her about what had gone across the road down there past their house. And she kept saying, oh, it was probably just a, some kind of bear or something that came up in here. And I said, I'm like, uh, I don't think that was a bear. <laughs> uh, I said it was way too big to be a bear. And uh, I said it didn't have the right head placement or anything else. I said it, it was not a bear. And <clears throat> in fact, what it looked like was a big black gorilla is what it looked like walking across the road is exactly what it looked like from that distance and um so anyway i'm sure that was the reason i never heard anything about it because i'm sure if any of those people reported it to the sheriff's department knowing our sheriff's department uh they weren't gonna pay any attention to that so but no i mean uh seriously they're the only ones that are close to me um uh, that uh, I ever really talked to and uh, her brother passed away here just uh, a month ago. So um, I don't have too much communication with them anymore. Right. Right. What do you think happens if somebody does make, uh, for example, a call to say uh, maybe a 911 dispatch and just blatantly says, I have a Bigfoot on my property. Well, I said that to a sheriff out there one time and I had accidentally um, I had a 911 call go in and I guess one of the cats had stepped on it on my phone. I had left it face up and one of the cats had placed a 911 call for me. And um, this was just shortly after the, the air conditioner episode. And I actually said something to the man about what had happened. And um, after the look that I got from him, I thought, you know, I'm just going to shut up. I kept telling him, I said, I have an anthropology degree. I know what primates look like. Uh, I know what humans look like. This was not a human unless it was Shaquille O'Neal on steroids standing at my window. And um, he just looked at me like, lady, <laughs> what were you drinking or what were you smoking? And I'm like, I don't do drugs and I don't uh, <laughs> drink. So, uh <laughs> What can I say? Um, but no, I, I got the look. Um, now, I will, I can tell you this, that I have relatives that uh, do work for uh, law enforcement out in East Texas, and they get calls in all the time out there. Now, those guys actually have had so many calls, and they're aware uh, that they are out there. They do actually take them seriously, even though I've been told I do refer the calls to animal control, but you know, <laughs> what can you say? Do you think animal control goes, thanks a lot? <laughs> yeah, really? I don't have a net big enough for that one, nor a trap. <laughs> oh, dear. What can you say? <laughs> yeah. Well, what do you think? I mean, you know, if the 911 gets a call, do they have to, and they refer to animal control, do they have to make a record or do they just, uh, you know, or do well, you I even think know? They do actually- I, I don't I don't really know. Um and um I do know I, I can tell you this that that, that's, that the sheriff that I talked to, he never made a record of it because I do know one of the dispatchers there at uh, uh the sheriff's department and she never got any record of it. So uh, I'm sure he just he just, you know, laughed it off and, and went on his merry way. But uh, uh I do know that in East Texas that I think they do at least dispatch people out because uh, one of my daughters actually uh, is a mail carrier out there. And she said one of the mail carriers had actually seen one run out. He was uh, going into work. Of course, they have to go into work uh, fairly early and get all their uh, packages and mail assembled. And um, he had actually seen one run out to the road and then turn around and run back into the woods. And, but, uh, you know, she's real anxious to see one, but she's never seen one out there. So, you know, it's like, if you're looking for them, you don't see them, but if you, you know, you're not looking for them, then they're everywhere. So. You know, I wonder about the mail carrier. I mean, what was his response? I mean, he's got to be like, really? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean do, do it. well, he was all excited. He was like coming to work and telling everybody, you know, and everybody's like, uh, yeah, right. Uh, but I mean, it's fairly common knowledge out there that they're out there. So, uh, um, 
uh, I know that my daughter had a cow that was calving here not too long ago, and she said, you know, it was warm. So she and my granddaughter were sitting out in the truck watching the cow, uh, and um, <laughs> she said, Mom, I had my window rolled down, and I kept hearing all these noises out there in the woods. And uh, she says, of course, she would pick, uh, Maria would pick right to lay right next to the woods to, to have that baby. And she says, I was having to listen to all this noise, wondering if there was a damn Bigfoot running around out there. (laughs) And uh, so, I mean, people are aware of them out there. And I think they take take them more seriously. It's like, you know, you talk to people in British Columbia and in Canada uh, and even Alaska. I mean, people just go, yeah, hairy man, the big hairy man. I mean, I had a native uh, friend in Alaska and it was, I mean, they all called it the big hairy man. And um uh, what is it, Potluck, that, uh, uh, Potlatch, that uh, there was two towns right there that, that they had so much problem with them that uh, they actually just, those towns just shut out and packed up and moved. And they had a cannery and everything uh, that uh, those people worked at. And they just literally shut those towns down and moved because they had hunters that were going off and disappearing and not showing back up. And, and you know, everybody was talking about the big hairy man that used to come in and harass people in the, the villages. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's common knowledge up there and, uh, uh, and in East Texas, but uh, people don't seem to get, you know, all excited and bent out of shape unless they're causing problems. Yeah. We just had a uh, guy on the other day, uh, a couple episodes back who lives in Alaska and it's an ongoing issue there. I mean, it's, it's astounding how much, of an issue it is and how often the creatures are seen and you know for whatever reason it, it's not making it into uh, mainstream media well i do know of one episode where there was a gentleman that <clears throat> they actually came upon his car uh and to be honest with you i cannot remember if it was on the alcan going in um going into um uh, the Wasilla Valley, Wasilla Valley there, or whether it was uh, north of there, but um, he his car was approached by another vehicle, and the gentleman had gotten out because the door was open on the, the vehicle that he found, and there was blood, I guess, all over the, the car, and, and drag marks where something had actually snatched this guy and drug him off into the woods, and he was never seen or found again, and uh, that was right on the side of the road in Alaska. So, you know, yeah. that's not oh, something yeah. that a bear would do. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. And, you know, it's interesting. I mean, it's, here's what I find fascinating. It's, I think it's generally kind of accepted that, you know, Bigfoot's a Northwest, Pacific Northwest, Canada, and to some extent, or a lot up in Alaska. But, um, it's, uh, you know, Texas has just got a huge ongoing, um, I don't know, community of these things out there for a long, long time. I mean, when you're a little girl, your grandfather told you, watch out for the woolly burger, uh, woolly booger. <laughs> um, <clears throat> have you heard anything else? Uh, I'm curious about East Texas. If you, you said it's a a very active area. Um, what else? Well, I, do, I do have a friend and um, you really should talk to him at some point in time. Uh, I won't use his name here on the, the, uh, uh, the show, but uh, he is uh, active, actively involved in doing research. And he calls me a lot of times and asks me questions and such about this and that and the other because of my background in anthropology. And um, he's done a lot of work down in Sam Houston State Park and um, all up around the Brown Spring area. And he has had tons of uh, sightings and uh, encounters and uh, some of them good, some of them not so good down there. Now, down in the Sam Houston State Park, um, I heard about this. And I actually think that there was something, if I recall recall correctly, my daughter had said something that she saw it on, uh, there might have been a YouTube article or a news article that she saw on um, the 
phone that um, there was a young man that had been hunting down in the Sam Houston State Park area. And when they found him, he'd gone missing. And when they found him, um, that he was face down in a puddle of water, like something had stood on him and pushed him down into that water. And when they found his rifle, his rifle had literally, the barrel had been bent back on it, which there's, no, I don't know of any human that can do that, uh, bend, bend a, a barrel back backwards on a, a gun. And, yeah, um. Yeah, and that's how he was found. And and then they did have a young lady that I related to you before that had, uh, um, and I probably shouldn't say how I found out about it, but uh, she was actually had called in and was uh, uh, on the phone with law enforcement. And uh, she was, uh, the only thing they ever found of her was uh, her shoes in the woods, nothing else. And that she was uh, saying that, uh, uh, you know, something was chasing her and that uh, um, it was very similar. It reminded me of the the situation with uh, uh, what was the football player's name up in, uh, oh oh gosh, where was that? Up in the Northeast somewhere where that young man uh, that was a football player, there was a quarterback that had a, a very similar incident where he was had called his wife and he was saying that something was chasing him. Well, it was the same thing with her. She had actually called her mother and uh, then called in to law enforcement to, for somebody to come rescue her. And they found her vehicle on the side of the road with the door open and uh, she was long gone. And all they ever found was her shoes. And this was kind of, uh, up in the Northeast, you said? And no, this was this was in uh, East Texas, over in uh, I believe Panola County, somewhere in the uh, Carthage, uh, Tenaha area up there. Yeah, the young lady. I said it reminded me of the the episode with the uh, football player that was up in the Northeast, and uh, that uh, had disappeared, and then they found him uh, uh, later, and I don't even know if they ever determined the cause of death, but it was one of those kind of had uh, overtones of missing 411. Huh. Where you just find the shoes and don't find the people. <laughs> well, that, uh, and you know, that's an ongoing thing up in Alaska. Uh, well, uh, Western Canada, Vancouver Island, and e- as far south as, um, you know, down in the Puget Sound, it's, it's, I read an article on it. It's been going on since the 1800s. Yeah, finding feet and shoes. Yeah, right, exactly. And there's all these theories, but uh, yeah, it's like really. <laughs> um, I think I think we have a pretty good idea. What I don't think you have to have too many theories about that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, one of them was it was a serial killer. I'm like, well, that's one of the oldest serial cult killers around. So there's a cult. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this, all right. So this gal was, and you said she's in, called Panola County, Texas. It was up. Uh, it was up in the either Panola County or uh, I probably should have checked on this to just so I could give give you accurate information. But it was it was in <clears throat> Far East Texas, right on the Louisiana border. Panola County, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, is um, has the highest. Um, reported uh, sightings of uh, Bigfoot in the state of Texas. And that is right uh, on the uh, Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas border up there. Oh, really? Okay. Deep piney, deep piney woods. Yeah, it is the deep piney woods. And I actually had done some uh, archaeological work, uh, field work uh, for a company um, out of Dallas, Texas. I used to work for them. uh, And, um, we did a lot of survey work um, anytime that uh, they put in all field pads or any kind of land disturbance in uh, Lake Ray Roberts. I did all the archaeological field work for that too up north of Dallas. And while we were actually doing that, uh, uh, just a side note there, that was when they were having the sightings of the, um, uh, the blonde Bigfoot up around uh, north of Dallas there. 
people were seeing this blonde colored Bigfoot all over the place. And here we were out there trolling in the middle of the woods. And I'll never forget somebody broke into our vehicle one day while we were at lunch and stole all of our coats and took all of our compasses. So the next day we all went out and three of us actually got turned around and got lost, me being one of them. And uh, here I am wandering around in these woods and I'm like, uh, and having visions of (laughs) running into this blonde headed uh, or blonde uh, Bigfoot out there in the middle of nowhere. But uh, yeah, you can look that up back in the the 80s uh late 70s 80s they were having uh bigfoot sightings up there all the time of a blonde colored one and uh, but anyhow so just out of curiosity so when you would do your uh archaeological digs i'm assuming this is you know like you said for earth disturbances you're looking for artifacts and you, you need to verify that there's not um something of uh archaeological value before they can do a dig, Correct. is that how that works? Okay. Yeah, yeah. We we would go. We do survey work uh, first and uh, walk transits and uh, with the crew. And I, the crew that I had, I had five members, and we would walk transits and uh, usually like 30, 40 yards apart. And um, <clears throat> then we would be recording any type of historical sites, whether it be um, you know uh, Indian sites or uh, old buildings or anything that might be of value and we record all that and then uh, that's turned into the company and then the company presents it and then uh, they determine whether they want to do second or third level mitigation on the property you know and actually go out there and do digs so um, and you can hold up um, any type of oil uh, platforms or anything like that that they're pads that they're trying to build out there they can't put anything in there until uh we've done the archaeological surveys out there oh that's fascinating um so, yeah it was, it was very interesting work oh absolutely absolutely um never ran into into any oversized bones i take it <laughs> no <laughs> I, the only thing that we ever ran into that was kind of peculiar was, uh, and it was on a farm, and I actually did ask the guy, we found a bone field, and it was like in this, uh, just a cleared out area back, way back on the back of this guy's property, and I thought, well, you know, a lot of ranchers, when they have a cow die or something, they will drag it to the back of their property and just let the coyotes have at it. And um, I thought maybe that was what he was doing, or maybe they were doing butchering and taking the, the, the bones back there. And, I mean, I'll be honest with you, it never occurred to any of us at that point in time that that might have been, you know, a site that, uh, you know, uh, Bigfoot or anything like that might have been feasting back there. But uh, uh, I did ask the farmer if he had uh, when was dragging his cattle back there, and he actually looked at <clears throat> looked at me like I'd hit him with a brick. Cause I was like, "No, uh, I haven't dragged anything back there." And I said, "Are you well aware?" And he said, "No, that he wasn't aware." So he actually, uh, after we left the property, uh, I assume went back there and checked on it because he didn't have any knowledge of all these bones being back there. So if it wasn't him losing cattle, somebody was. So you know, and they were all ending up back there on the back end of his property. And it was just like on a little ledge right up above a, a, a creek there. So we just, and it was in a, a, a clear, nice cleared out area. And it was, uh, had uh, shrubbery and, uh, and a thicket all the way around. So uh, you could eat at your leisure back there, actually. Yeah, wow. Um, and that sounds familiar with, somewhat familiar with some other things that we've heard is... Um, you know, the creatures, you know, they're just, it's like there's an area that they kind of feast at and they deposit the bones there. So mm-hmm. you'd think somebody would know about missing cattle. Well, listen, um, this has just been absolutely fascinating. And I'm especially fascinated with areas like Texas where you just have a, a substantial, um, you know, base of reports of these creatures there. So um, we need to stay in touch with you and stay in touch with us. Uh, we're just about out of time. Uh, do you have any 
questions for us before we uh, wrap it up? No, I don't think so. If I if I have anything exciting happen again, I'll give you a call, and then I'll uh, before you go, I'll give you uh, Chuck's number to give him a call, and uh, I think he can give you some real exciting stuff. <laughs> okay, first, yeah, that'd be great. First, we'll have to have you on a Q and A too, since you you have degrees in anthropology. It'd be great to have you on. Oh, I'd love to do that. Yeah. All right, everyone. Well, stay tuned for the next segment. In Bigfoot History San Diego Union, March 9, 1876 contains the following story A Wild Man in the Mountains The following strange story is sent by a correspondent at Warner's Ranch in this county We know the writer to be a perfectly reliable person and believe his statement Singular as it may seem to be fully entitled to credence Warner Ranch, March 5th About 10 days ago Mr. Turner Helm and myself were in the mountains, about 10 miles east of Warner's Ranch, on a prospecting tour. Looking for an extension of a quartz load, which had been found by some party some time before. When we were separated, about half a mile apart, the wind blowing very hard at times, Mr. Helm, who was walking along looking down at the ground, suddenly heard somebody whistle. Looking up he saw something sitting on a large boulder about 15 or 20 paces from him. He supposed it to be some kind of an animal and immediately came down on it with his needle gun. The object instantly rose to its feet and proved to be a man. This man appeared to be covered all over with a coarse black hair, seemingly two or three inches long, like the hair of a bear. His beard and the hair on his head were long and thick. He was a man of about medium size and had rather fine features, not at all like those of an Indian, but more like an American or a Spaniard. They stood gazing at each other for a few moments when Mr. Helm spoke to the singular creature, first in English, then in Spanish, and then in Indian. But the man remained silent. He then advanced toward Mr. Helm, who, not knowing what his intentions might be, again came down on him with a gun to keep him at a distance. The man at once stopped as though he knew there was danger. Mr. Helm called to me, but the wind was blowing so hard that I could not hear him. The wild man then turned and went over the hill and was soon out of sight. Before Mr. Helm could come and see me, he had made good his escape. We had frequently before seen this man's tracks in that part of the mountains, but had supposed them to be the tracks of an Indian. I did not see the strange inhabitant in the mountains myself, but Mr. Helm was known to be a man of unquestioned veracity and I have no doubt that the entire truth of the statement. Welcome back from the break, everybody. We have my uh, best buddy Milo, you know, from growing up and all these years on with us today. Tom, you don't have a lot of questions, but we'll just kind of, like we usually do, let it go. I want to ask something first for the audience. We're kind of experimenting with things. Would you prefer, I mean, I know there's a lot of people that comment that they like the three-hour show. Tom and I have talked about either breaking it up and doing, say, part of it, part of the show on Saturday and part on Wednesday, or we do the three-hour show on Saturday and then do another piece, a one-hour piece on Wednesday. Can you let us know, folks, how you feel about that? Tom, anything before we get rolling here? Or? Yeah, no, that's uh, that's a really good question. So if you guys want to, if you have thoughts and comments, put them in the comments for this show. But also, if you want something to, you can also shoot us an email, questions at creekdevil.com. So questions, plural, at creekdevil.com. And we're just looking for audience feedback to get an idea of what you guys uh, want to hear from us. Personally, I think it'd be kind of nice to keep the three-hour show for the weekend because there's, like I said, a lot of folks that message and email. They really like that long format. But um, it would be nice to add a one-hour piece midweek. And, um, you know, let us know what you'd like us to do for that one-hour piece. Maybe something different than, you know, what we usually do with the Q&A and things like that. All right, well, let's go ahead and kick things off. 
Okay. I'll jump in there. Uh, this is from Lisa, and this is on our last episode with Daryl. And uh, Lisa's Daryl's cousin, and she says she just wanted to uh, – she grew up next door to him, and they spent their childhood together playing outdoors. And, and uh, she just wanted to really thank us for having him on and just saying that um, – Living in the Pacific Northwest for 23 years recently, she's heard plenty of Bigfoot stories. Uh, only one was intriguing. And so anyway, we just want to thank you, Lisa, for sending that comment in. And um, she said she wasn't 100% convinced until Daryl told of his experiences. So really, that's kind of a shout out to the folks out there. If you guys have had an encounter and maybe you're sort of on the sidelines about whether to whether you want to talk about it or not. Uh, and maybe this is just the thing you're looking for. And you say, hey, look, I, I think I'd, I'm ready to kind of share it with somebody. Shoot us an email, questions at creekdevil.com. And we'd love to hear from you guys. We're kind of fortunate tonight. We have Milo with us for this se session. <laughs> um Milo and Scott, my old buddies from, you know, like I said, growing up, I've known known these guys since junior high and high school, are going to be on next week's show, main uh, segment. So um, we had, we're lucky to have Milo come on and chat with us. He used to do the blabs that we did way back when. I can't remember, Milo, how long ago that was, like four or five years ago, something like that. Oh, um, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, about that long, and then... Well, we got a lot of participation on, on the, the JRG Facebook page. That's the Jevening Research Group page. I think we're yeah. we're getting up towards, towards around 2,700 members on there. And and they're, they're getting some good skeptical views of things. You know, people post things and then they'll discuss it. I am really happy to see that and that they can pick things apart instead of just saying, oh, yeah, that's, that's Bigfoot. Well, you know, pick apart the elements. Uh, there was there was a video I sent it to Tom. In fact, it was something that somebody put on TikTok, and I don't, I'm not familiar with that app. So, but anyway, they put the video up there, and, and it's first of all, it's a it's a game camera, and it shows a couple of deer at night, and I mean they're lit up with infrared light, pretty good, and and the guy who's posted the video says that there's supposedly a Bigfoot behind some. There's some like stumps and trees and things in the background. And occasionally the deer will pick their ears up and they kind of look that way, but they're looking in other directions too. And they don't act particularly frightened. I mean, if there was an apex predator that close, you know, with them, yeah, long, they'd be gone. them long noses and them big ears, they would smell or hear something very quickly and they'd be gone. <clears throat> um, and then it switches to daylight. Well, well, first thing, the game camera zooms in. Well, game cameras don't zoom in. Sorry, you know, that, that was the first red flag, and that's the first thing it told me it was fake. And then it switches to daytime, and then you see this big, you know, shape behind the trees. And and, and the guy, you know, he says it's the best Sasquatch video ever. And <laughs> it's just, there were way too many red flags. And, and the people on, right. on, on the page, you know, they picked right up on that. And so it was kind of nice to see that, you know, some good skeptical thinking. Yeah. Well, you know, my... The best video I ever see was the Patterson movie thing. That you can't beat that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You can't beat it. Everybody else tries and whatever, and goes out for a night screaming and yelling and think, "Oh yeah, Bigfoot's going to be there." Man, you got to be acclimated. Uh, I want to say acclimated to the to the area and and be there for a while. You just can't walk into some place and think some wild apex predator or anybody for that matter is going to you know they're going to hear you smell you whatever so right be I like us a lot of it's just be like us that we just walked into them <laughs> yeah i mean I, I mean being like you know 12th grade 11th grade like we did it was you know yeah we're thumbing our way through that stuff but to be out there and say oh yeah there's big foot foot you know that's uh, what a load of crap <laughs> <laughs> Tom, you want to weigh in? Yeah, well, I had a question for Milo. Uh, Milo, you've been on at least two of these uh, expeditions with Will when you guys were kids. Oh, yeah. yeah at, least, 
at least two good ones. I would say the the funnest one was definitely the St. Helen trip. You know, I I think the one at Clark's Ranch was the scariest one where I just you know I basically uh, I didn't know what to think then. You know, I think a lot of it for me. It was just excitement and just being with Will and 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 talking about it afterwards. So, so what did you think before you headed out there? I'm kind of curious. You had a, an idea that you guys, you knew why you were going out there, right? It was oh, like, yeah, definitely. Yeah, not just you know, camping. I was eager for that. You know? Yeah. Now, yes. were you involved before then with any, because, you know, Will found the footprints when, uh, th- Will, you were what, 14? Roughly when you found those first yeah. footprints. Yeah, Milo and the I was on the railroad track. Yeah, yeah. My, my, Milo and I didn't meet till I don't know, a year or two ninth after grade. that. Yeah, ninth grade. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Um, and so I'm assuming Will probably called and told you about the when he had his encounter with the two of them, right? When he walked into the, uh, you know, in, into the brush in, into the woods tree line in his backyard we, and we talked boom, about that are. later because it was you know milo lived farther away and uh and yeah, i live i live like 13 miles away from high school and for me to go to bills i have to take take another bus and just you know wait and either that or have somebody come pick me up or i'd just stay the night and go to school the next morning with will that's usually that's, all that one. that's usually how we did it <laughs> yeah, that's a lot how we used to do it. Well, our, remember, remember our parents, none of our parents in the whole group were going to cater to us and just drive us around like they do nowadays. It was like, you got to figure out how you're going to get there. And well, get we back. used to ride our bikes everywhere, too. We did, yeah. But, you know, it was kind of like we were the goonies of the age. <laughs> I think that's the best way you want. We were the goonies. But to answer you your know, question, Tom, John Adams, he lived close by me. He lived maybe a quarter mile away, so... It was John and his his brothers, then another guy Rick that lived on the other side, kind of over by Scott. Right. Well, and I was just curious, um, Milo, if you were part of the gang when Will, when you called up your buddies and you guys went out in the woods with your rifles, uh, you know, tracking these things down, I was just wondering if Milo was part of that, and you know, what was his thoughts? No, he wasn't part of that. No, I was. I was later on. I was like just ninth grade. Eighth grade, ninth grade. It was right seven, seventy four when that happened. So, yeah, that was just about time we I, we hit high school too. Yeah, just about then. Yeah, ninth grade, seventy four, seventy five. Yeah. So we, I, I think I started to meet Bill after we st- we had a couple classes together, and the stories he would tell in class was like intriguing, and that got me excited. Oh man! Well, you know going coming out of a stuff and living with my father it was like oh man i could not wait to go out camping with will i i remember when we first met it was in a i, I want to say it was an english class and we had to do papers that we had to read to the class <laughs> and and i did one on the gigantopithecus i did some study on that yes you yeah i remember <clears throat> that and and my comes up to me and he says what is this crap <laughs> <laughs> But it, I, I was excited about it, you know. It was like yeah, well, I, I really, I wanted to know more. Yeah, you were, right. you were asking think, if it was real. Yeah, you know, I, 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 was it real? How do you find out if it isn't? Wasn't? What do you do to to do this? And and I, he goes, well, why don't you come out with us? And that, man, it started that day. It just started. You know, he goes, well, how about this weekend? Come home on the bus with me and and we'll we'll start going out. And sure enough, that's how it, we all worked it out. Start hitting the woods. Yep. Yeah. You know, I'm really curious and we'll never, never know the answer to this. But, you know, all the times, Will, you guys went out there looking for these things and everybody had your rifles. I'm assuming you had like what? Something more than a twenty-two, like a thirty odd six or you know, thirty. We only had our rifles one time. That one time. Yeah, just that. Well, didn't we have? Because Scott brought his twenty-two, and that thing had like a hair ass trigger on it. Man, you would sneeze, and that thing would go off. We used to go. Like, we used oh. to go shooting, just target shooting. Yeah, Scott's Scott's twenty-two was awful. 
<laughs> that was a freaky thing. Woo. But uh But when we went looking for these things we didn't we didn't go armed. I mean as the most armed we were was machetes and wrist rockets. <laughs> <laughs> with with uh steel stock. Oh chunk. god, yeah. yeah. Oh <laughs> man, I used to man, I think I spit I spit my dad's whatever I Every time I would be in there just cutting that crap. <laughs> well, you remember, well, the teacher, the teacher was on, I think that Mr. was his, Wallen. Yeah, that was his last year of teaching. He was retiring and he just couldn't control us. And he finally just gave up. <laughs> and he, and so Milo and I were in there just doing whatever we wanted to do. And, and I don't know how we got the bright idea. One day there was that one inch solid stock, solid round stock. Yeah. And, and it had, they had a machine that would cut it, right? That would saw it, and we just went in and made a whole bunch of these half inch chunks of this. Man, stuff. I, I walked out of there with like marble bags full of that crap. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Because, <laughs> well, I mean, we, I, I think we all started thinking about RVs and all kinds of stuff, you know, how to get out there and all terrain vehicles before they ever had any. Yeah. All the time, Will, the time that you're out there tracking this thing. You know, you get the footprints in the frost before the sun came up and melted the frost. Any idea? Do you ever? Do you think you ever got close to the thing, or was it just? No idea. See, there were three of them in that group too, and only I don't know where the third one was. We only found tracks of two, so I, I have no idea. I mean, of course, the tracks were fresh; they were from that previous night, but they didn't seem to stick around long. I mean, they were, you know, they milled around a bit. Um, where I encountered them, and then we followed the tracks north uh, out of the area, and I think they were headed up towards the South Hill Puyallup area, where that's that's where all the activity was. But they passed through where yeah. I live. They passed through that area. Well, wasn't it like the pipeline road or something that's, over like where Bill lived? That's where the it seemed to be kind of the epicenter of that area. That's where Green and Hendon camped. Yeah, because that's where we took the Buick and just walked around kind of like Starsky and Hutch in that thing. You know, I'd drive the car down and everybody else would be out like tracking in the woods. It was crazy. I, you know, we were trying different <clears throat> tactics and whatever. You know, but... I, I forgot we'd gone down to that area. I remember John and I went with his brother, but I forgot the whole rest of us went there too. Yeah. Cause we took the, I remember cause we had all the doors open just in case we had all run. <laughs> I, I probably told you guys what happened with John and his brother, Jeff. <laughs> we, oh, that one. Yeah. Yeah. That was on the pipeline road, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and it makes sense just talking about the behavior of the creatures. It, they probably use that as an easy access, you know, pipeline road. They don't have to go through the woods. They can just walk along. It kind of makes sense and that there was, you found them. Yeah, and there was, well, see, there was the, um, at that time, it was all a lot of forest up there. I mean, a lot. I didn't realize how big that area was until I went up to visit, you know, my sister and brother-in-law one time a few years back. And they have all these, you know, developments up there. And, and one area is called Sunrise. I think it's Sunrise. Anyway. Yeah, it is. You know how you know how big that area is, Milo. I didn't realize how yeah. big that was until I saw it open up and all them houses up there. I mean Well, it, it goes up way behind the Puyallup Airport, all the oh, way yeah. back. Yeah, and it's, then it's a huge area. Well, it, it almost all runs into where I live now here in Enumclaw. So yeah. you look at all that going uh from that west point of uh Puyallup south hill all that towards me it, it's wide open and then then i live in the foothills of of the mount baker national forest so uh it, it's crazy out here i uh I, I think a lot of it is just where the developments are pushing uh we just got three new housing developments here in enumclaw so and it, I know we're got to be pushing this, these animals or creatures, you know, towards a certain place where they're they're congregating. I would think. Oh, they, they still think? they still got so much country up there. I mean, you know, you get you get towards Mount Rain, heading towards Mount Rainier on four ten out of Enumclaw. There's yeah. that's all open country up there, so they got lots of space. Uh, but well, 
that's the thing that I I I, I would like to once I get healthier and I feel that it's really coming then I look forward to when Scott and I can just hop in the RV and take off for like a week. Right. You know, and, and, but that's the thing that is my goal is to stay out for a week or longer mm -hmm. as, as a hermit and, and just stay out there. You're going you know? to convert Scott. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I don't know if I could do that, get him away from Susan, but you know, <laughs> I, I, uh, I think Jeannie, on the other hand, I think she would enjoy it, enjoy it for a week. Oh, or sure, sure. That's my old wife. Um, I think a lot of it for me, my 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 thought process is, if if I stay out longer, the harder it is for for them to recognize me as a human. Mm -hmm. I, I know that sounds weird, but I. I don't want to go out there eating hot dogs and stuff like that. I want to stay kind of like, uh, you know, with, around the element instead of feeling like I just came out there smelling like Ivor's soap or something. You know what Wait, I mean? Milo, you're you're a human. You're trying to tell us you're uh, human. <laughs> well, you know, I, 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 I thought you were a Sasquatch. <laughs> oh God, there's times. People call me that I'm so hairy, you know. So. <laughs> I'm a I'm a different species. I they call me Q tip head, so he used to be you animal know, you, on, on the know, you, you answered a, you answered a question I had and that is you still have an interest in this topic and you still go looking for these things. I did, yeah. I mean I think the last time I went well with Bill last year when he came down up. Wasn't it last year or two years ago? Uh, two years ago. Year and a half. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, we we went back to the old place where we you know where it all started and and that kind of stuff and I walked out there. But I I mean I've been in and out of the hospital for pulmonary bull crap. So, but uh, my stuff is healthy. I got new meds. I got the VA. You know they're they're cracking down on a lot of stuff so saying that I, yeah i'm getting healthy where i can go back out well that's cool my it's good to hear that you used to have an interest in the topic oh yeah stuck with you all these years i i've always had i mean i, I got paper clippings because a lot of it for me it's like i i like following the reports of missing hikers and campers and that kind of thing because a lot of it just seems to be off the wall uh, they want to get the case solved really fast where a guy was off the trailhead, his pack is ready on the trailhead, but they found his body like uh, 180 feet up an incline or of a hill who's 70 years old without nothing. So well, that's, a, yeah. that's a good point because I spot checked some of the uh, missing people and there seems to be a lot of them in St. Helens area, yeah. and especially uh, Mount Rainier. Uh, yeah. There was a well. This was at the Olympic Mountain Olympic. Oh, okay, uh, on the west forest, side. Okay. Over on the was, west side. Wasn't that the guy that disappeared about a year ago, Milo? Two. Yeah, I think it's two years. Two years ago. Now, and it was like New Year's Eve and or New Christmas Eve to New Year's. It was like right around there, and he, I, I got the paper clip and file, and I got a file for that missing people stuff so yeah it was really interesting because the sheriff's report said a bear must have did but his body i mean he was it wasn't mauled it, it was <laughs> he was dragged up a hill yeah it was crazy well know, we talked about that quite a bit you know the bears get blamed for a lot of things <laughs> yes yes i know and it, and we and we know the bears have been victims of these things as well. Yeah. Well, you know, there's there's the question is you got now you got the government going well. You better not kill one. Well, here's the thing, you know, if you're in their stuff, they're coming at you, and if you're armed, well, hell, I'm gonna take whatever chance. I'm I'm shooting it. <laughs> well, <laughs> self defense. I think I don't yeah. think there's an argument against that. I'm not gonna go out. No, I you know I I think it's just weird how you people talk about oh you shouldn't go out there. It's like tree hugging stuff, you know. I mean, if you need toilet paper, don't you cut down a tree? 
Mm. What? I got my own Sasquatch. He's talking to me. I can hear him. Yeah. <laughs> what? He looks like the Wookie. <laughs> what? He wants to join but, in. Uh, That's like like Brand's cat used to uh, used to make noise while we were recording. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tom, do we have any more questions or? Yeah, we do. Um, so here's here's one. Danny writes us some questions, and here's one of them. He wants to know. Uh, Will, why does Mr. Black give you information? The, and well, he said Black's plural, Mr. Black's plural. Well, the other What's, ones uh, I'm not sure. One specifically has, we have a shared background. Not that we knew each other personally, but it's it's something we did in the past that was the, the same setting. And that was the reason he reached out. Yeah, and so you guys have some common ground there, right? And and yeah, some of the other ones are, are just you know they they've listened to me on radio shows and and then felt compelled to contact me. I don't know what their motivations were other than that, but that's the best I can surmise. Yeah, and you know my thoughts are the Mister Blacks out there are regardless of their position, they're still people. Absolutely, and they've got to be in. Yeah, they got to be intrigued by this topic as well. Uh, so maybe they sort of vicariously can um, work through you for for some of the information and answers and that sort of thing. Well, a lot of it's they just wanted to assist me, uh, which I'm you know eternally grateful for. Believe me. Um, yeah. Except sometimes some of the information is a little bit, uh, you know, it's put my mind in a whole different place. You know, and I know people, you know, there there's some listeners that get wound out. Oh, and there is, I do want to address one. There's one person who keeps messaging on YouTube, and we're on lots of different platforms, but I, I look at the comments on YouTube, and, and, he, and he consistently says, when are you going to have Mr. Black, a.k.a. Kunbo, ba- Tim Baker? And, I, and I, I just have to laugh because I want to categorically state, you know, for absolute fact that Kunbo Baker is not Mr. Black. He's not even in his universe as Mr. Black. I mean, <laughs> um, so we just we'll dispense with that nonsense right off the bat. Yeah, that that was interesting. I I didn't think of him as Mr. Black. No, and I know, you know, I just spoke with one of the Mr. Black. So well, I, very I, intelligent guy. I, I not, think not. I think the gist of it was you know because. Kunbo said he worked had worked for NASA as a, as a contractor. Well, Mr. Black, and first of all, NASA isn't going to have any connection with Bigfoot anyway. Uh, so how would he know anything from working as a contractor? Uh, Mr. Black worked directly, I won't say where or how, but he worked in a position where he was able to see information about these things and talk to people who were... Now that's interesting. That just makes my jaw drop. Kunbo is not Mr. Black. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay, so Danny also wants to know, he's, uh, I think he's in Northern California or somewhere, somewhere on the east side of California, eastern uh, end of California. Um, He wants to put, he wants to put some stuff into glass jars or into jars and hang them up into trees and as a sort of a lure or an enticement for the creatures wants to know if we have any ideas what you know what kind of uh how high should he put those and where you know well uh, it's, what should he put in jars it's, it's kind of a two-edged sword really with putting stuff out they might be curious but most often uh, they know those are human-made objects and usually avoid them you know we're gonna we're gonna have Forrest on uh, on a Q and A probably next week uh, if we can get her set up. Now she's got degrees in anthropology, so I'm sure she will t- talk about this. But anybody can go out there and check on you know what primates do, you know in regards to <clears throat> things that don't belong naturally in their environment, uh, and especially man-made objects. They go out of their way to avoid stuff like that. Well, see there. That, that goes with mine where somebody just drive out in their vehicle, goes out there for 12 hours. Oh, there's Bigfoot. Really? I mean, how how is that when you're out hunting it with 
without any any process of of strategic. Well, I'm not going to say that. No, no but strategy. Strategically. Yeah. I, none. No. I, none. I, I, Just going out there with the TV show saying, "Well, that's Bigfoot. Can you hear him scream?" Really? Yeah, that's I mean, that's nonsense. <laughs> we can pick on this one. You know, Tom. Actually, you picked up on this. Um, <clears throat> we won't name the show, but you know, they supposedly have a quote unquote algorithm for finding the creatures. And and tell us what the algorithm is, Tom. Well, what I heard is the algorithm is the topo lines, the, the contour the, lines uh, on a topographic contour map. Contour lines, yeah, which are elevation really markers. Like They're elevation yeah. markers on the map. Yeah. Is all they are. One, one over what fifty thousands or one over two hundred? What what contour lines are they even friggin' looking at? Friggin' what? It's irrelevant which which scale they're looking at. They're they're simply using contour lines, which is it's a ridiculous thing. It it sounds good to people who don't know anything about maps, but contour lines are elevation markers, and yeah. and they show you how steep or flat a surface is. Yeah. Um, they show you and if you look on the features. legend, it tells you how far they're in between, how far apart they are to right. what yeah. feet. Right. It's not going it, to yeah. be some magic formula for finding a Sasquatch. I guarantee that. Uh, I am so disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like a Tom. <laughs> oh, man. You know, I, I well, just... You know, see... I've, my experience has been... I, I boiled it down to only three things. You only have to do three things. Well, you've heard me say this more than once. There's only three things you got to do if you want to find Bigfoot. Number one, you got to go to where they are. Number two, in order to go where they are, you got to know where they are. And then the third item is forget about enticing or luring them out. Yeah. I mean, really? It's not going to happen. If you're going to encounter them, they're going to find you and they're going to show themselves for their purposes you're not going to entice them out that's not going to happen yeah you can provoke them i've spent many thousands of hours over the last five decades all along the west coast looking for these things and and it's really 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 difficult you know i mean you can drive along in your car and look out the window and a lot of people do that and claim that's their field research and that's fine and dandy and everything but you know, get out and hike the timber cross country. I've done that. I, I can't even begin to tell you how much and how far, how many miles I've hiked through timber like that. The times you find them is when they come and find you. Yeah, that's. I would say that that's they they. It was like at the Clark Ranch. <laughs> yeah, we, we we had just gotten there. Well, we got there and set up camp. And we cooked some, I, I guess, beans and hot dogs or something. I mean, we weren't, weren't real sophisticated as teenagers, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we sit around and we're talking, had the fire going, and that's when we started hearing the screaming. You know, and that started the whole night's events that escalated throughout the night. Yeah. You know, it wasn't... But we didn't sleep at all. No one no. would... The tent was just the tent. It was like, oh, yeah, that's shelter. That, what is that? Protection to, from what? I, I think it was more psychologically. We had, like, some kind of a barrier, at least on one side. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not no. much of a barrier, though. <laughs> no. My, my thoughts on tents are you sit inside the tent and you wonder what is making all that noise. Sniffing, breathing, tapping. out of it. <laughs> well, we've, we've right? talked to a lot of witnesses that have you know, been in that situation, you've been in the tent and heard these things, you know, and touch the tent and smell and walk around it and do all these different things. And it, it's kind of a, it's kind of a synthetic burrito, really. <laughs> yeah, and it, exactly. it's at that point, you're wishing you were home in bed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. No, I wish I was in an M1 tank. Yeah, that would do it. Right. I, I, you know, it's kind of like the whole Jaws thing. I need a big, you need a bigger boat. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's. It, hey, Milo. What? The one thing we had, the one thing we always had going for us is we had one person that ran slower than the rest of us. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he who the, shall not be the, named. <laughs> yes. I was just going to say that. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> he who 
who shall not be named. <laughs> oh, my God. I love well, that. Well, you know, Milo, talking about the tank, we had a guy on. And we've had him on twice, at least two times now, retired colonel. And he really cracked me up the first time we had him on. Uh, Will, you remember this guy? He, yeah, he Alan. mentioned. Uh, yeah, Alan. Yeah, the lizard turrets. Yeah. <laughs> or the turret Liz- lizard turret rats. Turret rats. Yeah. And they heard that scream, and he didn't have to say a word. All, next thing he heard was a bunch of hatches slamming shut. Yeah, he was he was an armor officer, and I think when he was a lieutenant or a captain, one of the two, and they had all the the unit out in the field someplace, and, and they were all just kind of right. they were all just I don't know probably Fort Hood or someplace, but they were. Uh, and I'm wrong, Alan. If you're listening, you you can correct me on that. But they were in the field, and and they heard a scream or a series of screams, and the guys were just kind of you know how it is with armored vehicles, just kind of lounging around in the evening, right? Oh, yeah. And he, and he said when the scream started, all the guys just automatically packed up and got in the vehicles and closed the hatches. <laughs> well, see, that's prudent. You know, that... It, it, yeah, okay. <laughs> First of all, you know, if it's a field problem, you don't have any live rounds. So, nope. You know, you, you know, you're out there. But now that I'm in a 70-ton vehicle... <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it's just the it's the army in me, you know. It's like, hey, but yeah, if you really want to hear a person cuss a sailor, my wife, she's oh, Jeannie, she she's a sailor. <laughs> Woo! The name. But uh, no, I, I I really believe like well, let's look back at the Clark Ranch after a good day two days of thinking about it after our last chat mm-hmm. um you know i i really believe that the the youngsters in us back then uh i know my imagination was running wild before i saw this those eyes we, so well we had a lot going on before that happened though you know all that oh, screaming that was but, going on and that the, they were circling well, the camp and you got to understand who I am. You know, all that was fine and dandy until I actually saw the damn thing. Right. You know, it was like, because every other, because Will was the, the voice of reasoning, you know. You know, he was like, Milo, you okay? You okay? It's, it, this is what, you know, just stay by the fire. We keep the fire going, you know, all that kind of stuff. And but you know I I was I was a city boy I was like you know I look at all this I lived in a grew up in a trailer court and all of a sudden you know hey you know I'm out in the woods with Will and I'm gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> I, we t- I took care of you though, Milo. I know that's what I mean. <laughs> I, but I I look back at it all now as uh, when I saw those eyes it just that far up without any other explanation i really believe that 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 cemented it for me well i remember afterwards at school do you remember john did the sketch of what you saw you were telling him and and you actually had the outline you know you know the head and the shoulders too well i you know i wish i could go back with that you know, with a sketch like that and look about where it was and how much of the trees and stuff that were blocked by this thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it, it's kind of like going back to where people say, okay, the stop sign was here, it walked past it, and then you measure from that that point of how far up did it cover the stop sign to do this? It's kind of like with my, uh, my brother, uh, my son-in-law, he... He saw one, and and I went over to the house where and saw where this flood lamp is. Mm-hmm. It's twelve feet in the, and it hit it. Oh sure, sure. Twelve feet. You know something going back to you mentioned. You know I, I was the voice of reason back then. Now you have to remember we were teenagers, and right. I didn't know crap either. <laughs> but you were more you were woodsy, and I wasn't. I was a trailer court rat. You know, I mean, come on. Uh, or trailer trash, whatever you want to well, call I, it. Well, I hunted and fished from the time I was pretty young, so. Yeah. I didn't do anything until, actually, well, you and me. You know, that, that was my, that was the whole cool thing. It was like, holy crap, this is cool stuff. <laughs> 
Yeah, it definitely was. Now, did you guys afterwards, did anybody go and walk around the perimeter of the lake to look to see if you could find any kind of footprints you know, or anything no, like that? No, hell no. I know. I, I couldn't wait to get out we, of there. We, as first light, you remember how we sat down? We were so exhausted. It was like four thirty, five o'clock in the morning. It wasn't daylight yet. And that big spruce log was laying there. We sat down shoulder to shoulder with machetes. And we're like, yeah. you know, if it comes after us, we're, we're, we're going down fighting. But we fell asleep. Yeah. We'll feed him Paul. And and a couple of us woke up woke up right at, like right at first light. It started turning daylight, and we're like, "Come on, you guys got to get up." But we we hurried and packed everything. And we got the hell out of there quickly, and we never yeah. we never went back there, except except to the Clark's house. You know when Green called and and wanted to go over there, but we didn't go out in that field or anything out in those woods again. Interesting note that the Clarks. I think they made it crystal clear that they weren't going to go out there with you, right? Yeah, you remember Milo when they said you guys, you guys can go out there, but yeah, we're not they, going. They, they basically said, "Well, we'll point you that way, and you go out that way for like 300, 400 yards, and, yeah. and then there's a there's a clearing in the woods. Just make your camp over there, and then you you you'll hear it. You you it won't take long." Yeah, and they they said they weren't and, going. You guys can go, but we're not going. Yeah. And they didn't ask for like a list of next to kin from each of you, or no, you know, no, no. And that 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 part's the scary part. But we, you know, now that I'm sixty, I will be sixty four. But you know, I look at all that now. I was like, God, I was lucky. We were all lucky back then. Well, not you. You, you. I I would have followed you, but. <laughs> Like I said, we had somebody who ran slower than all of us, so and they'd already groped him. So, <laughs> it's like they already had a taste for that. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> squishy butt. <laughs> hey, Milo, what when you saw the eyes looking at yeah. you? Did you did you pick up any kind of I don't know how to put this? Like a do you mean my you hair on the back of my neck? What? What's that? Well. Could you detect any emotion or malevolence or like glaring at you or? I felt like I was, I you know, looking at it back then, who I am now, and I'm going to say it like this. I felt like I was a snack, if if anything. You know, he was probably looking at everybody else. Ooh, ooh entree. <laughs> you know, I <laughs> I remember. I wish I still had the sketch that John made. I had it for years, and and it disappeared so it probably probably got destroyed in that basement flood you know where a lot of my records ended up yeah um because you know john was good he he sat down with milo and had milo tell him and he sketched out you know and it was just the tent showed the tent and this thing standing behind it you know and and the eyes particularly the eyes were just even in the sketch were menacing i mean he just kind of went right well, through you and so and they were far apart i mean it was like this thing was massive. Yeah. I mean, he was, it was, the eyes, it, the eyes were a good two feet above the tent. Oh, yeah, they were well above the top of the tent. And, and of course, we you found know, the 18-inch tracks, so, I mean, yeah. we knew it was a big one. Well, how tall, how, what was the height of the tent, <clears throat> roughly? What was it, about six feet, Milo, or so? I, I would say seven, seven at the height of the, the, top, the tip of the middle of it yeah. was at least seven. Yeah, you're right, because we could stand up inside of it. Yeah. Well, this is a nine foot. Well, well, no. If the eyes are above that to get the top of the head, this thing is over nine would, feet tall. At least I would say two. Well, let's look at the. Uh, it was eighteen inch tracks. At least a seven foot tent to the height, because most tents. I mean, you had, you had head room. Okay, so. so the creature should have been nine feet nine inches approximately. So that's about right. If and it that, was a seven. Seven foot tent, two feet above that, a little better than two feet, almost yeah. almost three feet. So yeah, that's that's about right. Almost almost ten I, feet. So you figured the arms on that thing? I mean, he he could reach fifteen, fifteen. Well, what do I know? I I would say because I've never seen the arms, but I, you're. Is it kind of like a gorilla kind of thing where it's past the knees and it just goes up and they can just reach for everything? Oh, sure, sure. So, I mean, massive. God, this thing had a weight got close to a 1,000 pounds. Probably well, more than that if he's well, that big. You know, <laughs> I, I, that, that, I'm looking. 
you know, it was like, God. Here we are, we're thinking we're, we're Apex something. I'm talking like, you know, ooh, a war vet. Not there. I wouldn't even go in there. I would go in unless I can take an M1 tank. <laughs> well, you know, one thing I found interesting, or not interesting, but I'm just curious about, is the Clark family themselves. I mean, they this wasn't a one-off for them. My understanding was this was... An ongoing thing. They they heard yeah. this for them. It was ongoing. I remember that from everything Will was telling me. Even after we left and go to Germany and stuff, Will we would always talk about it. You know, so I know that you know because I stayed in the army twenty five years and I I missed out on a lot when Will came back. But uh, you know I I. I would really, God, that would be fun to talk to them about, you know, really, if they remembered anything. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't, haven't been back there. I haven't talked to any of them since, geez, those days. Yeah, the the whole Rene, the Hendon, and all those guys, Green and mm-hmm. stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, and the God. Clarks and all that. I never, Yeah. I didn't really know, the, I knew, what was it, Andy Clark? Wasn't he the one that was in our class? Yeah, Andy was in our yeah. Class. I didn't. I didn't really know him a little bit, but that's interesting. He wasn't out there when we were there, was he? Ah, uh, you know, I think he was. I don't remember. It. Well, that was my next question. It was Milo, you, Will, Paul, and was John? You said John. No, it John was another was guy. There. We'll we'll just call him Bob. Okay, think about it. Um. If you could do it all over again today, knowing what you know now, that Clark Ranch was just a golden research area. Yeah, it was the Epic Center. Well, it was, it was, see, that area isn't far from the Nisqually River. And that was a different group that was coming down from Mount Rainier from that way. And the group that I encountered, that was coming, they were coming down the Puyallup River. So they were two, those were two different groups, you know, occupying different areas. Yeah, but just the excuse me, the consistency yeah. of the, the activity. Well, we were uh, we were kind of in a in a strange situation there because it wasn't that far apart between the two groups that were you know moving well, through we the areas. Right in the middle of both of them. Yeah, we were kind of centrally located in between both of those areas. So I mean, you could go over one area, and you you we had the experience, and not only not only that, and uh, Milo, I don't know, I, I don't think you got to meet. Um, uh, Dwayne, he actually verified what happened to us. He was he was a ten year old kid when we experienced that, right about the same time period in broad daylight next, next to the town of Roy. He was a city kid, and he went out to visit a friend's a friend who lived out in Roy, <laughs> and they were by this little pond, and and he saw one of the creatures, and it was right out there by the Clark Ranch. So the same time period, same area. You know, but somebody else saw the creature too, or at least one of them. Yeah, that was my next next question. Same time. Yeah, same. Roughly time. the same time frame. Same time wow. frame. Wow, wow. I wish yeah. that Clark Ranch was. I'm from what everything you said. It sounds like that area's been, you know, overdeveloped. Well, but not so much. I mean, Roy. There's there's more people well, around Roy, there, but it's still kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Fort Lewis re- military reservation there too. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, you got a lot of that. That's won't be disturbed for a while yeah they won't mess with that area because a lot of that's like impact area and ranges and stuff like that right i got a i think my uh i got a fort lewis special and it, it has all that on there mm-hmm. but you know i think for that while there's there there's one thing i was digging on for a while then i got sick but it was like the encounter soldiers have had looking at it from the Fort Lewis area. And, and that's, that's uh, revealing in itself mm-hmm. because, you know, a lot of times, cause well, uh, Will and I were both stationed there and, and there's times where we would be on patrol in, in, in Fort Lewis. And, and you, I've told it on the show what, before. Remember me telling you, I had, I remember I had a 15-man squad when I was with the 5th Cav next door to your yeah. unit. We, uh, 
we flew out. I don't remember where we were at. We were really well, out in BFE one time, and uh, that's I won't say what that means, but <laughs> <laughs> they, they flew us out and they dropped the squad off. And and my platoon sergeant radioed me in the evening. He says, "Hey, there's nobody's out in your region at all. There's nobody out there in that part of Fort Lewis. So you get, you can do whatever you want. We're, we're not going to pick you up till morning." Uh, you guys can train, you can go to sleep, do whatever at your discretion. I said, okay. So I told the guys, I said, we're going to practice some ambushing before we crash out. So I told the squad le- or team leaders, I said, go deploy your men. I grabbed my radio man and we went in between the two fire teams to, you know, for command and control position. Right. So we go into the tree line and it's black. And, and remember it was, it was, would have been around 1980. It's when they first come out with the ANP VS fives, night vision goggles. Yes. Yes. And they gave me a it set. Was a big thing. They gave me a set to try out because they, they were just, you remember it was all experimental then still. So they gave me a set and you know, they were okay. They were, they were, weren't great, you know, but they were sure better than the old starlight scopes. And so I, I put them on and I'm walking, I went into this tree line leading this kid, you know, behind me, my PFC. And, and it was super dark in there. So you, you, you still couldn't get great details, right? Because it was passive light. And if you didn't have a lot of light, you weren't getting a lot of detail. But I could see, you know, enough to walk in there and not bump into trees. And something like the size of a sheet of plywood right in front of me, like 10 feet, took one step from my right to my left. And I about crapped on myself because I knew exactly what it was right away. And I'm backing up into this kid. I'm like, Douglas, get out of here. Get out, 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 out. <laughs> you know? And I and I yelled at the team leaders. I said, you know, rally all the men out here in the middle. And it was a big wide area in this road, you know, kind of a extra wide, grassy, mossy area. And I told the guys, I said, yeah, I decided we're gonna, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do it. We're just gonna, you know, pick a buddy and sit back to back and just go to sleep. And they're not gonna pick us up till morning. So we sat there for a while, right, in the dark. And pretty soon one of the guys says, hey, Sarge, are you, are you sure there's nobody out here? I hear somebody walking around us. And I said, yeah, they told us, told me there's nobody out here in this area at all. And then a couple of the other guys pipe up. Yes, yeah, yeah, we can hear somebody walking around us. And then one of the guys says, Sarge, you're from this area. What do you know about Bigfoot? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, oh, yeah. so I told them, yeah. I told the guys, those guys would probably swear today that that's what was walking around us. It was circling us. And, and again, like you said, Milo, all we had was blanks. You know, I had two M60 machine guns and, you know, God knows how many belts of ammunition for, you know, blank ammunition. And I, I figured, well, if nothing else, we'll light the area up and make a hell of a lot of noise. I mean, it won't do any damage, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But Well, that's what we did. I mean, I was in the scout platoon of the 3rd to 60th Infantry. I was in the scout platoon and we did the same kind of stuff yeah. you know we'd go out there ahead of everybody else do our thing and and the crazy part was you know a lot of times we were alone in like two man's lplps you, you, you got a taste of my you got a taste of my job <laughs> well, you know i mean yeah because i i had my own squad we were a scout team i had three gun trucks i looked like rap patrol that's what it was and we would go out and and we would we would do patrols and make sure all the sectors were good and then the the main force would come in but 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 it was when you're alone with the two other guys you know because i had my driver and and gunner and we would go out and it would be quiet oh yeah and then all of a sudden it'd be really quiet mm-hmm no crickets nothing. no nothing yeah. and you got to understand back on the other side of the road it's swampy it is yeah it's real marshy out there it's marshy as hell and so i mean all kinds of wildlife would be out there and all of a sudden it was quiet and and all i could think about was great this is the clark's ranch back <laughs> this is over there I, you, you made me think of something you know Oh, all the wildlife out there, I had the guys, I, I don't know what, you know, God only knows what kind of mission they had us on, but I had my men spread all over the damn place. So I was I was going around with one of my corporals checking on the guys, you know, because we'd have LPOPs, and they had them spread. We were spread out like a mile apart, the whole squad was. And I was going around checking, and I left one of my E4s 
in this spot. And it was next to a road. I said, you'll be fine by yourself. You're by a road. There's going to be traffic, blah, blah, blah. So we come back and we're like, where the hell is, I can't remember what his name is. You know, where's he at? And, uh, uh, a bear had treed him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is like the first time my guy has ever encountered an ant hill. Oh, there's lots of those out there. Big ones too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah at least. Yeah. And, and that was, you know, a lot of it for my guys was like, okay, it's too quiet. We didn't make that happen. Cause we just, it wasn't that, that, you know, it was a, a startlet night. It was back in the day, mm-hmm. you know, we're talking, what, 80, 70, well, what, 80, yeah, 80, 80 to, 81, that time frame. Pre, pre Mount St. Helens oh, yeah. eruption. Well, yeah, it erupted you 80. Know? Yeah. So we, we went through a lot of stuff where, what would when, when things would just be out of place for me where being with will back in the clark ranch it was like okay this is weird because everything's quiet yeah it would it would get quiet and there was you know a lot of birds and stuff out there but sometimes it would be just dead silent out there i mean really quiet i mean where we could actually wow did you ever hear any stories of anybody seeing these things out there in your unit yeah well, it was. I was like, I said, "Ooh, that's Sasquatch," <laughs> and they look at me like, "Ooh." <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> yeah, it was like I ain't going out there unless I'm loaded up. You know, it was like, yeah, don't, don't, don't be lost out there. You know, that's the way it was. Yeah. But it was like uh, the guys who would actually walk and ride their bikes from Roy to Fort Lewis, main post where we were, because Will's unit was right next door to mine. We could wrist rocket each other, you know? I mean, that's how close yeah, we Yeah, there was just an aid station between. In fact, even our, our barracks, the building, was right next to each other, and there was an aid station in between Milo's and mine. Because <laughs> we were in Germany, and we, we were, that bummed me out, because we were separated by, like, a few hundred miles then. we were all because he we were all were scattered in Mites? where were you i was in Mannheim. Mannheim, yeah and i was in bomb holder oh yeah so, my fond memory of bomb holder is going to the nco academy there <laughs> yeah that's that was a fun place yeah but uh, <laughs> we'll just say fun <laughs> yeah i was like nco academy man that's like going back to basic when you're like 80 years old it was worse than basic oh my god Oh, no kidding. I was like, God dang. Well, we didn't. But it was the, we get a couple one of, of the best ones. We got a couple of minutes. Should we we just kind of get back on topic here for our listeners? Um, Absolutely. You know, I didn't tell you. I got an email from a guy, and I, I, God, I can't remember. I think he's, I think, I want to say he's from Ireland. I could be wrong. Uh, so, uh, Michael, if you're listening, I apologize if I got me wrong, but he was in Eastern Europe and got ran out of a forest. I think he was in one of the Slavic countries and got ran out of the forest by one of these things. You know, that's interesting because I've wondered about Europe. If these things are still, uh, I don't want to say still there because I think there's some that are still there, but if they're still a, you know, a thing, if they still have a significant presence. Apparently so. I, was he stationed over there? No, no, he, he, he there? wasn't military. He was civilian. Uh-huh. And I can't remember offhand what he was doing. See, that's, that's, hmm. that's the only downside to... Uh, uh, when we do a segment like this is, you know, we'll talk, something will come up and then it's like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, I'm not prepared with this guy's uh, account. Oh, here it is. Ooh. Here it is right here. Yeah, Michael Kilcourse is the man's name. Let me pull this up and I'll... He said, um, during the early 2000s up to 2008... Uh, okay, he was talking about... Okay, he, he is... He is from Ireland. Um, sorry, folks. I'm trying to get to the point. He's kind of filling me in on stuff here. So let me see. Let me see. He said he'd walked. I'd walked about 15 minutes or so on the small dirt track that wound around uphill, a steep climb, then realized how quiet it was compared with the rest, or compared to when I had first started. No birds. No insects. Nothing. Like you were just talking about, Milo. 
Right. I started to worry in case I got lost, so quickly spun around and suddenly, or and started to make my way back. When I noticed something bipedal was walking in unison with me, but uh, but inside the thick tree line, I stopped. It would stop. I yelled a few choice words. The guys taught me in Slovak, and carried on. Every step was uh, copied nearly stride for stride. I stopped again. It would stop. Uh, at this time, the tree line was kind of thinner, so I could make out a big black outline, seven feet or so, in the brush, so no features. Uh, I didn't need any more hanging around, so I took off like a scalded cat, and I could hear my heart beating in my chest. It says, to my horror, this thing was running also. I could see it. I could see the downhill exit out onto the cobbled road that led to the village, about 200 meters away, when I noticed the heavy footfall had stopped. Uh, I looked around while still running. So, yeah, I mean, he that's kind of kind of spooky, really. You go for a hike, and then, uh, you know, pretty soon you find out that uh, you're being followed. Then you're you see alone. the thing, and, and, it, and then it starts chasing him. From the observer's standpoint, that they probably, if you said he's from Ireland, I mean, they probably just don't have a whole lot of experience with this stuff. It has got to be at the shock of shockers. Well, oh. you know, I, I can relate. You know, I never heard of this until we saw the footprints and John's dad told right? us what he thought. And, and his information exactly. was limited, yeah. you know. I don't remember where John's dad said that he, he got the info from. Probably, you know, a magazine or something, but uh, probably... Well, how long hmm? is... Was John's dad from around here? No, they actually moved from the Carolinas. John John was oh, new wow. when he when I first met John. They had only recently moved there from the Carolinas. Okay, so they were from the, from the East Coast, and uh, well, his dad's retired Navy, well, so. Well, Carolina, don't they have like that ape thing going on over there? Well, they, what they call the ape. Well, they have a different variety of them there. Yeah, you know, than what we do here, but but, but he was the thing that but they it wasn't you know you're talking early seventies so. Right. Uh, there was no, well, you know, they didn't know anything. Well, the Patterson thing, I mean, we were in high school, junior high, when we saw that. Well, so. I didn't actually see that till after all this stuff. I mean, I didn't, had no knowledge. I mean, that was really wasn't that widespread. Um, wow. Because I saw it at the Parkland Theater, you know, the Patterson film Bigfoot. Yeah. You know, it was like, oh, my God, I got to go see this. Yeah. Well, that's the whole thing when, what was it? I don't know if it was Learman in search of or the chariots of the gods and all that. It was all that it, my enthusiasm just went out the, off, off the scale with all that. Stuff. That's like, you know, in, in the December of 72, when Mark and I were heading over to John's that day, you know, we didn't know anything about this stuff. Never heard the word Bigfoot before. And right. we saw those footprints and we're like, what the hell? <laughs> who's, who's got feet that big and why are they barefoot in this snow? <laughs> you know, it didn't make any sense. And then, you know, because it was super cold that morning, the guts aren't frozen. Whatever, and it had to be. What were you, 12, 14? We were 14. But how, yeah, we were 14 yeah. at the time. So we we had no I idea. Would, I mean, barefoot. Man, what, these guys on drugs or what? Well, I kept thinking, who's got feet that big? Because they were, you know, like a foot well, and a half long. My sister. She's like a friggin' little troll. <laughs> <laughs> But hey, you I know, wanna, I was I wanna... about the whole thing with the Yugoslavia thing that brought me to the. Remember those? What was it? Seven or fifteen? Those hike Russian hikers that got taken out oh, and yeah. just ripped apart. I mean, that was wicked stuff. That that to this day, I cannot get enough of that story. To this day, ever since. And it's been like three years now that I've heard about it. And the more I try to dig into that, so that what story, what story in itself. What story is this? Oh, uh, the dead love. Oh, uh, right. yeah, the dead love. yeah. The dead, dead love. Well, you know, now that gets some different incarnations periodically. The first time I read that years ago, I, it was there was a lot more things that, and it was supposed to be like UFO connected. Because, and there were a lot of things like radiation and stuff like that. Cur- the current incarnation is they're, they're trying to pin it on Bigfoot. Okay. But it just, I mean, to me, that was just intriguing, I guess the best word I could say it. But now that I have my own stuff in my own backyard, like this thing where this guy was 
you know, took off and he's dead in, in the Olympic in the Olympic National Forest. You know, he was seventy three years old. He was Christmas Eve and those kind of things were missing campers and hikers and you know i just i know the area he was hiking in and and there's usually quite a few yeah, people up it's here right, it's not some place you're going to get lost in no it's right over there by hurricane ridge and all right, of that over there right. so you know those are the things that i'm starting to look at more and now that you know, I have to say this, you know, I backslid a bit. So now that I got Will and I'm on skate, Skype with you guys more often now, I would like to say I'm I'm hitting that crap back up. Well, I shouldn't say crap, but, you know. <laughs> right. All this information is just, you know, I, I got a new life on it. Right. So, hey, you know, and then now that I got Scott more who wants to go out, but I don't think I can keep Scott for a week out. Yeah, probably not. So I'm going to have to either do it by myself because Jenny's going back to college. So I'm I'm dating a college student. (laughs) Tom, we got any more questions? We're getting kind of short on time. uh... I want to uh, I want to get this one in here because this is really a good one. This is Vicky from Wisconsin, and she says, "Hey guys, have we ever received any reports from railroad personnel who've seen Sasquatch, or from people?" riding on a passenger train and i actually like this question because um <clears throat> you know i had a pre-stint had had i'd worked somewhat in the railroad industry and i've wondered that as well if um and we've i've heard some accounts i don't know how i have no idea how accurate they are <clears throat> excuse me that the creatures um have you know basically hopped the rails but it's a good question, and Will, what are you? What are your thoughts? Have well, any? I interviewed a guy years ago. People? Worked. Uh, I can't remember which company he worked for. It was uh, one of the railroad companies, and and this was in kind of your neck of the woods, Tom, kind of central Oregon, and uh, apparently there were a lot of these things seen around the railroads and the trains. Hmm. Oh, okay. I can't remember the details. It was too long ago, but. Yeah, that's that was, and I'd love to talk to more people that work for railroad lines, you know, that have seen things or have heard things. Well, it kind of makes sense that they would use the railroad tracks because railroad tracks are basically not that different than a power line cut through the wilderness. Yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a way to navigate through areas and you know deer and other animals and it's easier to move along than going through the brush so sure it's a natural yeah so and i've often wondered she had a question if if passengers on a passenger train are going by and like hey look at that you know i I mean i've seen moose and i've seen deer on a train when i went to uh port uh not portland uh spokane going through the cascades so it's kind of neat isn't it yeah, it's, it's, I, it's a up great the, way to travel. Yeah, 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 it really is. I, I sat in the observation car going through the Cascades in in Washington. We were going to the Midwest, and it's really neat. There's snow on the ground. You'd see herds of elk, and it uh, was just fantastic. I'd be willing yeah. to bet I, there are plenty of people that have been on train trips that have seen these things from the cars. Oh, yeah, and just didn't know what it was. Or, or did and didn't want to talk about it. Yeah, both. I would say both. I, you know, oh, look at that. There's Sasquatch. Oh, shut up. You're drinking too much. <laughs> well, and then you've got the, uh, you know, you get, you're going to have a brake man and you're going to have an engineer, you know, in the locomotive, in the cab of the locomotive. And back in the old days, they don't have them anymore, but there used to be the caboose. So you right. had a, a conductor back there. And uh, always curious. I think it's an excellent question. So if anybody out there, uh, especially if you're if you're railroad personnel, like retired railroad. Retired how about the guys that? The, the, yeah, anything to do with that. You know, uh, how about the guys that go out there and repair that stuff all uh, all by themselves? You know, in their little work groups and stuff. Yeah, I'd say I'd I, say anybody that works for the railroad or or used yeah, to work. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And there's and a lot of times, even if you're not doing the repair, you're doing the track surveys. I I did that up in. Uh, Chehalis. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Chehalis, Washington. Yeah. Right. Up there in January. 
uh, it was it was cold. Just a tad. <laughs> Just a tad, but you know, you're out in the middle of nowhere by right. yourself, walking the tracks, taking notes, and you know, doing that sort of thing. So, well, listen, fellas, we're about out of time. Milo, Tom, any last thoughts or questions, comments? Well. well I- I just want to say thank you, Milo. It's good, always good talking to you. And I just want to throw out a real quick uh, for the folks out there listening. If you guys have any questions, shoot us an email, questions at creekdevil.com. Love to hear from you. Yeah, I like that idea. Because for me, it's more, I, I hear what people want to talk about, but I don't really see the the notes or anything to keep on track on stuff. I, I like to reminisce and, and just go for it, but... You know, I, I, you know, if there's structure where people want to know more structure, we can definitely go that way, too. Absolutely. All right, everyone. Well, stay tuned for the next segment. In Bigfoot history, Pennsylvania, 1838. From the Montrose, Pennsylvania Spectator, article titled, Strange Animal or Food for the Marvelous. Something like a year ago, there was considerable talk about a strange animal said to have been seen in the southwestern part of Bridgewater, although the individual who described the animal persisted in declaring that he had seen it and was at first considerably frightened by it. The story was heard and looked upon as more as food for the marvelous than as having any foundation in fact. He represented the animal as we have it through a third person, as having the appearance of a child seven or eight years old, though somewhat slimmer and covered entirely with hair. He saw it while picking berries, walking towards him erect and whistling like a person. After recovering from his fright, he is said to have pursued it, but it ran off with such speed, whistling as it went, that he could not catch it. He said it ran like the devil, and continued to call it after that name. The same or similar looking animal was seen in Silver Lake Township about two weeks since, by a boy of some 16 years old. We had the story from the father of the boy in his absence and afterward from the boy himself. The boy was sent to work in the backwoods near New York State Line. He took with him a gun and was told by his father to shoot anything he might see except persons or cattle. After working a while he heard some person, a little brother as he supposed, coming towards him whistling quite merrily. It came within a few rods of him and stopped. He said it looked like a human being covered with black hair about the size of his brother who was six or seven years old. His gun was some little distance off and he was very much frightened. He, however, got his gun and shot at the animal, but trembled so that he could not hold it still. The strange animal, just as his gun went off, stepped behind a tree and then ran off whistling as before. The father said the boy came home very much frightened and that a number of times during the afternoon, when thinking about the animal he had seen, he would, to use his mom's own words, burst out crying making due allowances for frights and consequent exaggeration, an animal of singular appearance has doubtless been seen. What it is, or whence it came, is of course yet a mystery. From the description, if an orangutan were known to be in the country, we might think this to be it. As no such animal is known, without vouching for the correctness of the story, we shall leave the reader to conjecture, or guess for himself, what it is. For the sake of a name, however, we will call it the strange animal, The Whistling Boy of the Woods. Welcome. This is a series of stories being brought to you by William Jevning and being narrated by Jim Sower. Story number one, Australia. Bigfoot spotted in bush near Sydney, April 15, 2009. Australian News, April 2009. Two backpackers on a year-long trip around Australia got the fright of their life last week while they were out trekking in the bushland in the vicinity of the township of Lura, not far from the well-known Katoomba landmark, the Three Sisters. It was early evening, and by the ladies' own admission, it was a bit late to be by themselves in the bush. Ingrid Schoen, 23, of Germany, and Addie Hansen, 22, of France, decided to head back into town 
when they heard the breaking of branches and loud footsteps heading towards them. Ingrid turned on her torch to light the track in front of them, and at this point they both claimed to have seen what they now describe as Bigfoot charge away into the distance. Admittedly, we did not get a close look, but we think that what we saw looked like the American Bigfoot, basically covered in hair and about two meters tall. It definitely had no clothes on and was not human. Ingrid told All News web reporter Jaden Cassidy, We were petrified and almost lost our way back in our nervous state, Ingrid commented. The Blue Mountains is believed to be the home of a creature known as the Yowie, basically Australia's version of Bigfoot or the Yeti. There have been many recent sightings there. Prior to the arrival of Europeans, local Aboriginal tribes were certain of its existence. Aboriginal communities still living in the Blue Mountains, along with some other locals, continue to believe that the Yowie might be out there in the vast expanses of Australia's Great Dividing Range. This is the end of the first story. Story number two. BBC's Online. So Weird, Lionel's Guide. The Ape Type. They're all big. They're all hairy. They're all colossal cocktails of man, ape, bear, and occasionally goat. But they're all over the world. Yeti in the Himalayas, Sasquatch and Bigfoot in North America, Yaren in China, Nguoi Rung in Vietnam, and the Yowie in Australia. Most of the time they're more frightened by the spotters, but they're not always harmless. An adventurer named Bauman was working as a trapper with a friend in the Wisdom River area in Montana. One night, when Bauman got back to camp, he found his friend dead. There were huge bite marks on the body, and the man's neck had been snapped by something with far more than normal human strength. A few days before the tragedy, they had both seen a strange humanoid creature, which they reckoned was about seven feet tall and this story was reported by President Roosevelt, so it must be true. American presidents don't lie, do they? In 1924, Al Ostman claimed to have been abducted by a whole tribe of Sasquatch. He was asleep in his sleeping bag when one of them picked him up like a rag doll and carried him away. As the creatures made no attempt to harm him, Ostman, who always kept a loaded rifle by his side when he was out alone in the wilds, did not wish to harm them. He finally got away by giving snuff to their leader and running away while the Sasquatch chief was sneezing uncontrollably. Many disturbing reports of the Yeti, or abominable snowman, a close cousin to Sasquatch and Bigfoot, have come in over the years from the Himalayas. In 1974, on a plateau 14,000 feet up near Mount Everest, 19-year-old Lakpa Shirpani was knocked unconscious as she tried unsuccessfully to defend her yaks from a yeti which killed several of them by twisting their horns until their necks were broken. This story comes to us from BBC Online. The end of story number two. Story number three. Alaska Magazine, September 1998. Volume 64, Number 7 Nathan, the Brushman By Velma Wallace Sasquatch, or something like it, appears in the legends of the northern Athabascan Gwich'in people as Nathan, the Brushman. Is he a myth, a monster, or a lonely man? The Nathan was held in fear and admiration, although none could swear he ever actually saw one. If someone dared say that they did, people laughed, yet some believed. It is said that the Natan, also called brushmen, were men who were ostracized from the group for disobeying tribal rules. The rules of the wandering Gwich'in bands were simple and stern because survival was their main concern. The rules helped the people to survive their harsh environment, but they also were social requirements meant to keep peace. Some men, and occasionally women, did not abide by the rules, so the band leaders would ask the person to leave. 
The condemned person usually tried to prove he could survive without the group, but isolation taught otherwise. Physically, survival was possible. Emotionally, the human craved companionship. The rejected person would find himself slipping into the guise of a Nathan. He would hover behind bushes, spying on people. If he became lonely, he tried to kidnap a woman and sometimes succeeded. Others saw brushmen as non-human, but with human appearances and magical powers. For instance, the brushman possesses the ability to use mind power to lull you to sleep and then steal your loved one. Even after contact with Western culture, the Gwich'in people believe that the brushman still exists. In the late 1800s, an infant was said to have been stolen by a Natan and later returned. Although the Natan was feared, he also was romanticized. As a teenager, my mother often wished that she were stolen by a Natan. My husband told of a time when he hunted above the mountains in Chandelar country, and large, dark, and dressed in skins, uh, this thing appeared from the woods and knelt down to drink water from a stream. Geoffrey called out to him, wanting to believe he was just another hunter. The startled man looked up and then ran away. Geoffrey told others, and they laughed, for what was the typical response to anyone who said that they saw a Nathan? Despite people's skepticism, not long ago a sensible couple traveling down the Porcupine River spotted a man walking alongside the beach. When he heard their motor, the man disappeared into the willows. The couple searched the area, but found only moccasin tracks. Later that fall, in Fort Yukon, meat and fish that hung on drying racks were missing. People said it couldn't have been dogs because there would have been tracks, and camp robbers, gray jays, blue jays, and stellar jays, always leave a mess. Again, even in modern times, the myth of the brush man sends excitement through the heart of small Alaskan communities. Perhaps the spirits of those long ostracized and rebellious individuals still do roam the land, searching for food and companionship. Copyright, Alaska Magazine, September 1998, Volume 64, Number 7. That is the end of story number three. The Legend of Ohio's Orange-Eyed Creature, 1959. Old Orange Eyes was allegedly an 11-foot-tall, 1,000-pound Bigfoot creature that is said to live in central Ohio, on a lonely road called Lover's Lane, where it stalked teenagers. The Orange Eyes creature first gained notice on March 28, 1959, when three teenagers observed a huge, hairy, orange monster rise from a ground fog at Charles Mill Reservoir, near Mansfield. Then, four years later, the beast appeared again, and this time it was witnessed by several people. Scientists were not sure where this creature lived, but it is assumed that the beast might have lived in a tunnel in Cleveland's Riverside, where it lived in peace for more than 25 years. Then, suddenly, in the 1940s and 1960s, highway construction destroyed the tunnel that Orange Eyes was alleged to be living in forcing the creature to live in a stretch of forest behind the Cleveland Zoo. Finally, a group of teenagers invaded the creature's habitat on April 22, 1968, and chased the creature armed with baseball bats, flashlights, and ropes, and went into the forest to try to capture and kill the creature, but they found no sign of the beast. June 1991, Old Orange Eyes appeared again, and this time the bees ran past two people fishing near Willis Creek, scaring the daylights out of them before disappearing. It was said the way to find this creature was on Ruggles Road near Blue Ridge, and if the creature was there, it would appear curious. Witnesses of the orange-eyed creature say that there is no monster, just some crazy hermit or trademark feature by nailing two round orange bike reflectors to a stick, or teenagers using Christmas tree lights, flashlights, to frighten one another. Courtesy, Andy Ramirez, Saturday, June 23, 
2001, 10.38 a.m. This sounds like an urban legend, and it may also remind you of the Big Head Report from Richland County, Ohio, Vintage, 1978. This is the end of story number four. Story number five. Biddeford, York County, Maine, 1951. Suddenly, there he was, less than 15 feet in front of me. I am a 73-year-old man, and when I was 13 years old, I was on a holiday with my parents in Biddeford, Maine. It was a sunny, chilly day in April. I told my parents I was going for a walk along an estuary leading out to the ocean. When I came close to the flowing, chilly water, I saw a winding stream with sandbanks rising five feet in front of me. As I climbed up on one bank to look at the water a few feet in front of me, I saw a figure floating on his back, coming in with the tide. I'd say we spotted each other at about the same time, so I had just stepped up onto this dune from the land side. It was four or five steps, and I was on top of the dune, looked down at the water, and there he was, right in front of me. I can easily think about that moment, and again, I had no idea what I was looking at. I could see him so clearly, even his hairs as they swirled around his body. Well, mind you, at this time of my life, I had never heard of yetis, Bigfoot, or never read about them. I never knew they existed in my thirteen years of age. Uh, this figure had the shape of a man with grayish hair and a hairless, pinkish to reddish face with no hair on it. Although I had read about Bigfoot through those years, I never put the two together. I guess one reason was that this guy had grayish white hair, and I guess I didn't really think he was a Bigfoot. This guy had no breasts that I could see. Only while reading about Bigfoot recently did I notice that uh, an occasional you'd see a whitish gray one that would appear. So I got excited, and I had to write about it. The rest of his body had hair which moved as the water washed around him. He was on his back and floating in head first. He was no more than twelve to fifteen feet from me. I didn't move one bit as I gazed at him. His arms were to his side, and he lay motionless, but the incoming water was moving him along this creek at about four miles an hour. His body was barely awash, meaning that he was floating on top of the water with about half an inch of water covering his body, except for his pinkish, reddish face, which floated out of the water. I'd say from the front of where his ears should be to the front of his face. His nose, eyes, and mouth were out of the water. His facial skin looked wrinkly, not a lot, but he had mostly deep wrinkles on his face. Another thing about his face, the skin was bare, not even a whisker, no hair at all on his face. One more thing, the amount of his facial reddishness was like a sunburnt man. He showed no facial expression. Only his eyes moved over to me, and that was a little scary to me, but I stood there and stared back at him. I don't think I shared any expression. About the hair, it was about six to eight inches long and loosely floated around his body. It looked like it was the consistency or thickness of a golden retriever dog, not thick and matted like other Bigfoot reports that I've read. I did notice his knees, hairy, slightly bent up, and still just below the water. While I was watching him, I saw no effort to move his hands or arms. He easily drifted in without any body, arm, or hand movement that I noticed. I'll never forget how I felt during the brief time that I saw him. It was a deep soul connection that overcame me. I felt peaceful and calm during the whole time. I think I said this guy was about twelve feet from me, maybe even a little closer. I want to go back to where I saw him some day in hopes of connecting with him or his children. I thought it would be hard for me to walk down the little dune and follow him, and I don't think I would have since the dune led into the water, and I thought I would have gotten wet. Besides, I was so startled I could only look at him. 
Having never heard of these creatures, I ran through my mind every creature I had ever seen, and this didn't exist in my vocabulary of known animals. I was always interested in animals, and never ever saw anything like this. As I was gazing at him, he looked up at me, and we had an eye-to-eye -eye connection, which only lasted a few seconds. I can't say for sure, but I think his eyes were grayish-blue in color. He felt kindly to me, not startled, and I wasn't either. I will never forget this moment, and it's clear as a bell to me after sixty-three years. I ran home to my parents, who were in a house along the beach, and excitedly told them what I had seen. Well, they didn't pay much attention to me and thought I had seen a seal or a walrus or some other sea animal. I never thought much about it, and kind of forgot it after many years. Later I began to hear and read about Bigfoot, and never put what I saw together. The reason was that all reports I have read these creatures were never grayish-white, and they weren't very tall. This guy was only about six feet in length, no more, but finally, about ten years ago, I realized that this might have been a yeti. What else could it be? I feel a deep connection to the Bigfoot, and my experience will always be with me. I keep my sighting almost to myself, but though the, what I saw might help in some small way, I, uh, you know, tell others to help understand what's going on, you may publish this and use as you wish. You may use my first name, but please keep my contact information private. B.J. from Maine. Sunday, March 13th, 2011. That's the end of story number four. Thank you for listening. Welcome. This collection of stories is being brought to you by William Jevning and are being narrated by me, Jim Sower. Story number one. Grand Marais, Cook County, Minnesota, 2011. Snowmobiler spot Sasquatch in Superior National Forest. My sighting occurred in Minnesota. The nearest city to the sightings is Grand Marais, Minnesota. The sighting was in the Superior National Forest on January 29, 2011, around 3.30 in the afternoon. The area has many lakes, and this sighting was near a tributary to one of the lakes. The nearest road to this area is Gunflint Trail. What I and my sister saw that day was incredible. We were snowmobiling in the back country of northern Minnesota when my family and I were approaching a downhill section of the trail we were on. There was a clearing on the hillside above us, where there was a break in the trees. As I began my descent on the trail, I happened to look up and spotted something in the clearing about 200 yards above me. My sister and I were at the back of our group, so we both slowed to a stop to see what caught my attention. When we looked at what I saw, we observed a tall, man-like creature watching us. It stood there for about a minute, then reached up, grabbed a branch, and walked off into the trees. The creature we saw was maybe seven feet and was dark brown in color with darker areas around the face and chest area. It had long arms and a very human-like appearance with a high forehead area. We grew up in this area and know the local wildlife extremely well. This is not a bear or moose. We have never seen anything like this before. My family has been somewhat skeptical about the sightings of these beings, so when we saw it, it really frightened us. Sorry, no photos, because I was on a snowmobile, and it is rather hard to carry a camera in an easily accessible place. We circled around and could see large barefoot tracks in the snow. The snow is so deep in Minnesota this year, so it was hard to get close enough to get any pictures of the tracks. But you could definitely tell that a two-legged creature passed through the area where we saw it. I wish I had more evidence, but unfortunately I never dreamed that I would ever see something like this, so it really stunned us. My sister doesn't want to go there again, but I would really like to go back in the summer to see if there's anything to be found. This definitely made me a believer in Sasquatch. We did not report it to any authorities for fear of being ridiculed. My sister and I wished to remain anonymous for this same reason. 
but we would like the rest of our story to be shared so that others will know that they are not crazy if they see one of these creatures. Anonymous in Grand Marais, Minnesota, February 2012. That's the end of story number one. Story number two. A story out of Siskiyou County, California, approximately 1996. My name is Mark Kennedy, and I have a good story. It happened about ten years ago while a crew of twelve, including myself, was working a contract for the Forest Service to clear a couple miles of wilderness trail. I believe it was our first night at this particular spot, which was an area in the north end of the Trinity Alps. It was about twenty-six miles into the wilderness zone of the Trinity Forest. Camp was about five miles off the road in a beautiful meadow with a small lake called Red Cap Lake. We were done with our second day of work on this particular trail. It was a trail that took you through the prayer rocks of the Hoopa and Yurok tribes. Being in the Trinity Alps, obviously, we were really high up. We started at about 5,000 feet and maybe went up another thousand. The trail was about 10 or 12 miles long and split about three miles south of Red Cap Lake. One trail took you down into one of the many gorgeous secluded valleys in the Alps. The other took you to a point. Literally, the end of the trail was on a point that extended out quite a few feet from the true edge of the cliff. At that point, we were about 2,000 feet above the forest below us, so we were very remote. In the meadow, our first night there, we split into two groups trying to find the best camp spot. Really, not hard to do. The meadow was just about twice the size of a football field. Half was all knee-high green grass. The entire west side of the meadow was a small lake. You could catch pan-sized trout all day long in that little lake. Now, our meadow was off the main trail which rode the peaks of the mountains we were on. You walked down into this meadow from the north end, and as you walked, you got a bird's-eye view of the entire area. At the south end of the meadow was an extremely rocky cliff that rose above the lake about 200 to 300 feet, with the forest ending right at the edge at the top. So, now you understand the area a little as I tell this story. We were just finishing our nightly session to end the day around the campfire. Both campsites were at the south end of the grass, near the rocks, not far from one another. Everybody had just grown quiet as we all were drifting off to sleep. Suddenly, there was this god-awful screaming, howling-like noise that echoed through the meadow to make it sound like the screaming was coming from all directions. And for what seemed to be forever, the strange noise finally stopped and was followed up by one of the trees at the top of the rock cliff getting pushed off. I swear that tree must have hit every single rock that was in its path on the way down. And as it grew closer, the more petrified I became due to its sounding like it was right on top of our camp. Finally, the crashing noise came to a stop without ever landing on someone's tent. I still couldn't move, though. I was frozen position and I still couldn't move, though. I was frozen position and seeing the brightest shade of yellow I've ever seen. I think the others were, too. Nobody wanted to come out of their tents, but everybody wanted the reassurance of the others. The rest of the night was uneventful. The next morning we were all around the campfire, sounding like a bunch of old biddies gossiping about the night before. We found the tree that came down. It was a full-grown fir. Must have been a full-sized tree when it started down the cliff. Wasn't much left of it when it got to the bottom. I have never heard that strange scream since, and have been back in the woods plenty. None of us could come up with a reasonable explanation for what we heard that night. Shortly thereafter, we were joined by a guide who was Native American. This guide informed us that the prayer rocks I wrote about earlier are on sacred ground, and it is believed that there is a Bigfoot protecting that whole mountain. The guide also went on to say that the noise has been heard before, but in other places. We discussed how big of a creature it would take to push over a full-grown pine or fir tree. We know it wasn't a bear, unless bears are coming up with horrifying new screams. So, it wasn't a bear, but it had to be big and strong, 
the tree circumference was about four, maybe five feet, and we concluded from memory of seeing the tree it was about fifty feet tall and very much alive. At least the parts we were looking at came from a live tree. Nobody would climb up the easy rocky cliff to see where the tree used to be located, so I couldn't tell you if there were any footprints or not. But I can say that this story was backburnered in my memory to tell at the campfires for entertainment. It became very interesting when I heard one of many documentaries about this screaming, howling-like noise that the Bigfoot has been known to make. When I heard that, all of a sudden, that night needed to be shared. This is the end of this story. Story Number four, August 2007, Lake Tahoe, Placer County, California. Tracks found 18 inches long, 9 inches wide. I was camping last August with my nephew north of Lake Tahoe. We had been in a moderately developed campground, Crystal Peak Overlook, about 20 miles northwest of Reno, Nevada, where we live. There, my nephew made friends with another little boy, and I started talking to the other little boy's grandmother. She told me how her husband and son had found these big footprints that May along a creek above another nearby campground, Dog Valley Creek. They reported that in one print they could even make out separate tow tracks. They told a ranger who gave them some plastic tape to mark the spot. That got me curious, so we moved camp the next day to Dog Valley, a primitive campground. This is on the dry side of the Sierras at the Timberline, which is about 6,000 feet. Generally, the granite soil of the Sierras doesn't sustain much vegetation, but in this area several small streams converge to make a marshy pasture with a lot of biodiversity. We hiked up the creek that flows through the campground. It was a moderately steep climb, about a hundred yards up, I spotted the bits of tape tied to sticks stuck in the ground in a particularly thick patch of trees. The forest floor was covered with pine needles, but you could still see the depressed area of the prints sunk in the soil beneath leaves. In August, when we were there, even I, at over 200 pounds, didn't leave a footprint. But perhaps in May, in the deep shade, the ground had been muddy enough to take tracks. There were three prints marked out, but only one was still the outline of a full foot. However, I could no longer make out any separate toe impressions. It was about 18 inches long and nearly 9 inches wide. All the pictures I took came out pretty useless. Only the one where I put my bare foot in the tracks gives you any idea of size. The area is about 20 miles from human habitation but gets hmm, maybe a dozen people a week off-roading during June through October. The roads to the area aren't cleared in the winter, so there's hardly anyone there until May. The area is in the rain shadow of the high Sierra Peak, so even in winter there's probably less than a couple feet of snow, and it has lots of springs. I'd guess this area would have edible vegetation, if not all winter, at least very early in the spring. This area is not too far south of the Cascade Range, where there are more Sasquatch reports, and might be the sort of area a species might migrate south to for the winter. My nephew asked if the footprint could be made by a really tall person, like a basketball player, so when I got home I did some net research. 18 inches would be a shoe size, 26, many, many E's. The nearest I found was a guy 8 foot 4 who wears a size 25. There are less than a dozen people in the USA that tall, and most use canes or crutches and wouldn't be up to a barefoot hike in the mountains. I don't have a scanner, but I'll see if I can find a friend to scan the one halfway decent photo to you. Yes, I did have a camera, but it was a little 35 millimeter disposable and the footprint I found is hard to make out, and the markings on the measuring tape I had in one picture can't even be made out at all. There may have been three prints, but only one was clear enough to be a definite footprint. Gina Bagney, date Friday, 1st of February, 
2008. That's the end of story number four. This next story is entitled, Wichita County, Arkansas, 1940s. I am 75 years old. I was raised in the county of Wichita in Arkansas. We used to hear Bigfoots during winter time. Dad says they were panthers. Till Dad and his brother saw five Bigfoots in a pool of water at a river bottom. My uncle never got over that shock and would not go into the woods again. Dad said they were ugly, and the females had breasts that hung down to here, pointing to his body. I recall laying in that broad shack. It was cold, listening to them scream and scream, and they did a lot. When I was all of five years old, my dad was out running trap line and doing some farming in the summertime. It was at this time that our canned goods began to go missing from our smokehouse. One time, whole smoked ham disappeared. We could not figure out who was taking the food. My dad told mother that he thought someone or something was following him when he was out running his trap lines. One day he spotted someone. The little fellow was about four and a half feet tall with hair all over him. It also had a hump back and was very ugly in the face which had facial hair. Dad began talking to it and leaving food for the little fellow. It wasn't long before when my dad would go into the woods and holler, the little guy would suddenly appear. We named him Little Sam, which was a name my grandpa had. Nobody knew about Little Sam outside of our family. All those years, Dad was in touch with Little Sam. I only saw him two times in my childhood. After I got married and moved to Oklahoma, my mother wrote me and told me about Dad and Little Sam, saying that they had not seen Little Sam in some time, but they went looking for him and found him dead. When I was reading the letter, I started to cry. It was very sad. Little Sam never uttered a word that I heard about, but he grunted. This is the end of story number five. This is story number six. Wild Man in McHenry County, Velva, North Dakota, 1908. The Stevens Point Journal, Stevens Point, Wisconsin, Saturday, February 16th. 1908. Captured a Wild Man. Curious find recently made at Velva, North Dakota. The journal is in receipt of a clipping from a Velva, North Dakota paper from J. Thomas, who is formerly a resident of Keene, a son of Mrs. John Thomas, who still lives at Keene. It relates to the discovery of an alleged wild man near Velva, not far from Mr. Thomas's home. It is stated, for three years there have been rumors of this wild man being seen by persons of veracity, but he had never been encountered at close range until a few days ago, when two cattlemen, who were out hunting, suddenly came upon him face to face as he emerged from a thicket of brush. One of them succeeded in throwing a lasso around him, and before he could escape, he was dragged to a tree and bound round and round with the lasso. Later he was bound hand and foot and carried to town on a dray, where he was imprisoned in a basement. His only clothing was a loin girdle of sheepskin tied with binder twine. He had not been shaved or had a hair cut in years, and being a man of an extremely hairy variety, he presented a very grotesque and wild appearance. His eye-teeth are reported to be unnaturally elongated in the form of tusks. He refused to talk or eat anything, but drank water like a horse, half a pail at a time. The singular part of it is that this man has always been seen within two miles of the village of Velva. This is the end of story number six. Story number seven. Montgomery County, Arkansas, 
June 2008. On May 26, 2008, while the writer was in Clark County, Alabama, with area researchers, information was received by telephone from C.K., an Arkansas RFP research project investigator, that a married couple in the rural Montgomery County, Arkansas, had found evidence and had heard sounds that indicated more than one reclusive forest primate was foraging on their property at night. That information had been submitted to C.K. by the adult son of the woman who is joint owner and resident of the property. On June 7, 2008, C.K. and the property owner's son and the writer drove to the site and met with the couple. We arrived about 3 o'clock p.m. and left shortly after 11 o'clock p.m. The couple are in their late 40s and both have daytime employment in Hot Springs. They have purchased a 16-acre tract of land in Montgomery County and plan to build a home on it later. The north side of the property slopes to a small spring-fed creek. That hillside and the creek bottoms below are densely forested with various hardwoods, pine, and cedar. The underbrush has been cleared from the area of the planned home site. Along the creek there is a very thick undergrowth of vines and brush. The land south of the creek was at one time cultivated, but it is now overgrown in brush, vines, and small trees through which trails have been cut with a bush hog. Throughout the property there is a prolific growth of muscandine, summer grape, and blackberry vines. There are at least two pear trees in the old cultivated area, although the one seen by the writer appears to be ornamental Bradford pear. A neighbor told them that he had gathered pears from one of the trees. Earlier this year, the owners obtained utilities on the property, and in late February or early March, they opened a driveway through the timber on the north portion of the property. In late February of this year, they purchased a new travel trailer and installed it about 75 yards from the county road that is the northern boundary of the property. General information about the area. The actual location of the property is not disclosed at the owner's request. The property is within two miles of a river, which is a popular stream for canoeing and wade fishing. The site is within the foothills of the relatively small but rugged Caddo Mountains, which adjoin the southern flank of the Wichita Mountains. The area contains a large population of deer, turkey, and raccoon. The area has some cougar and no doubt many bobcat. A large male cougar was reportedly killed within one half mile of the property a short time ago. During this initial visit to the site, the writer noted a very fresh cougar track in the dust alongside the county road near the home where a wide, well-used game trail crosses the county road. While the area is expected to contain all the other small animals and birds common to this part of the state, it was surprising that no coyote sign was seen around the property, and when asked, the owner said they had never heard coyotes in the area. Summary of Events After moving into the travel trailer, the owners built a wooden porch patio underneath the trailer's retractable awning. While neither of the residents are hunters, and neither own a firearm, they are both avid bird and animal watchers. They have installed feeders for birds and began putting out dog food and scraps for the raccoons. For some time the couple had been spreading corn on the ground in a spot in the woods in front, east of the trailer, and at another location on the opposite side of the trailer as food for the deer. Sometime after they started putting out corn for the deer, they found a carcass of a deer near the west side feeding area. The witnesses stated that one of the deer's front legs and its head had been torn off. The head was found a few yards away, but the leg was partially eaten nearby. Both of the deer's back legs were broken, and much of its hind quarters had been eaten before the carcass was found. They stated the deer's body cavity and stomach had been torn open, and the internal organs had been removed. There was undigested corn and corn mush inside the body cavity and spilled outside the carcass. When the carcass was again viewed the next day, 
they saw fresh blood and an exposed shoulder blade which indicated something had fed on the carcass overnight. A week or so later, another deer carcass was found at the other baiting site in front of the trailer. Both of the deer's back legs were broken, and the carcass torn open and partially consumed. Shortly after finding the last deer carcass, the couple stopped putting out corn because they thought a cougar was ambushing the deer at the baiting locations. A day or two later, the couple found an injured dog lying beside the porch early one morning. They don't own the dog. When they stepped outside, the dog managed to get up and walk away, but there was a large bloody area on the ground where it had been lying. Shortly after seeing the injured dog, they found out that another dog, a Rottweiler weighing close to 200 pounds and belonging to the neighbor, had been attacked or otherwise injured. Something had torn off one of that dog's back legs. According to the couple, the dog somehow managed to return to his owner's home and still was alive. The couple said that now the large dog usually just stays on the porch and will no longer leave the owner's yard. Investigators note, when C.K. and the woman's son and this writer were leaving the couple's home site and driving through the woods road toward the county road the night of the initial meeting, C.K., who was sitting in the front passenger seat, told me there was a deer in the woods on my side of the vehicle. I stopped and saw an animal that I at first thought was a coyote moving through the woods. As I entered a more open spot, we saw that it was a large dog. We then drove away. The next night, about 8.30 p.m., the property owner called to tell me that when he went outside early that morning, he found a dog badly injured at the old baiting site east of the trailer. He said that it appeared the dog's back or its hips had been broken. He said at the time that he did not think that the dog would survive, although he said the dog managed to drag itself away the next morning. From his description of the dog, it was the same one that the three of us had seen the night before. Shortly after finding the deer carcasses, the husband spoke to a neighbor about any strange things that had occurred on the neighbor's property. The neighbor reportedly told him that five of his sheep had been killed and ripped apart inside an enclosure. When asked what he thought had killed the sheep, the neighbor said he thought it was dogs because he found some type of terrier inside the enclosure when he found the dead sheep. The couple stated that they had often sat outside on the patio porch at night and early in the morning during the week. He arises about 4.30 a.m. on weekdays to make coffee, and she joins him outside for a few minutes later. They both leave for work about 5 a.m. They stated that on many occasions when they stepped outside before daylight, they would hear the sounds of something crashing through the woods and brush near the trailer. They assumed it was deer bounding away, although they thought it was odd that deer would make such noise leaving the area. They said that on several occasions they had heard loud ape or monkey-like sounds from the adjoining woods while sitting outside late in the evening and at night. Recently it became apparent to them that at times the sounds were being made by more than one animal. A few weeks ago, a relative found a very large, about 18 inches long, track in a fire ant hill near the creek. The residents found another such track in one of their small vegetable gardens located northeast of the trailer. On the day of this initial visit, the writer observed two recently made tracks of about the same approximate size in the leaves and soil west of the trailer. The property owners also reported that some of the suet blocks used to feed birds were torn down and removed. They supposed that raccoons had taken the food, even though the couple thought they had suspended the blocks out of the reach of those animals. The husband began using wire to secure the door of the wire suet baskets so that raccoons could not open them if they managed to get them. Although the wife stated she could not open the baskets with her hands after her husband wired them shut, Something continued to tear the baskets down and open them to obtain and consume the suet blocks. Recently, the couple began putting up hummingbird feeders. Two of the feeders are small, but one holds about a quart of sugared water. A few nights ago, 
When the large feeder was nearly full, something reached the feeder and drank the entire contents, except for some spillage that coated the outside surface of the container. The feeder was elevated and suspended away from a tree trunk on an L bracket. Because of the position of the container and its capacity, the couple thinks it is unlikely that raccoons emptied it, although they concede that a raccoon might have been responsible. Other details. While completing this initial report, the writer telephoned the reporting witnesses at 8.40 p.m. on June 10th to ask about a few details. After clarifying the details, the husband asked if he could pose a question to me. When I told him that, of course, he could, he asked if I had ever heard whooping-type sounds, which he began to imitate over the phone. The sounds he made were nearly identical to the whooping sounds attributed to the reclusive forest primates. When I told him the possible source of the sounds, he said that both he and his wife had heard those sounds about twenty minutes earlier, coming from the opposite side of the creek and downstream. After some discussion, he said that he might go onto the porch and make those sounds to see what would happen. I advised him to be extra careful because the animals might be much closer than when he heard them originally. This is the end of this collection of stories. Thank you for listening. Frontiersmen are not, as a rule, apt to be very superstitious. They lead lives too hard and practical and have too little imagination in things spiritual and supernatural. I have heard but few ghost stories while living on the frontier, and those few were of a perfectly commonplace and conventional type. But I once listened to a goblin story, which rather impressed me. A grizzled, weather-beaten old mountain hunter named Bauman, who, born and had passed all of his life on the frontier, told the story to me. He must have believed what he said, for he could hardly repress a shudder at certain points of the tale. But he was of German ancestry, and in childhood had doubtless been saturated with all kinds of ghost and goblin lore, so that many fearsome superstitions were latent in his mind. Besides, he knew well the stories told by the Indian medicine men in their winter camps, of the snow walkers and the specters, the formless evil beings that haunt the forest depths, and dog and waylay the lonely wanderer who after nightfall passes through the regions where they lurk. It may be that when overcome by the horror of the fate that befell his friend, and when oppressed by the awful dread of the unknown, he grew to attribute both at the time and still more in remembrance weird and elfin traits to what was merely some abnormally wicked and cunning wild beast. But whether this was so or not, no man can say. When the event occurred, Bauman was still a young man and was trapping with a partner among the mountains dividing the forks of the salmon from the head of Wisdom River. Not having had much luck, he and his partner determined to go up into a particularly wild and lonely pass through which ran a small stream said to contain many beavers. The pass had an evil reputation because the year before a solitary hunter who had wandered into it was slain, seemingly by a wild beast the half-eaten remains being afterwards found by some mining prospectors who had passed his camp only the night before. The memory of this event, however, weighted very lightly with the two trappers, who were as adventurous and hardy as others of their kind. They took their two lean mountain ponies to the foot of the pass, where they left them in an open beaver meadow, the rocky, timber-clad ground being from there onward impractical for horses. They then struck out on foot through the vast, gloomy forest, and in about four hours reached a little open glade where they concluded to camp, as signs of game were plenty. There was still an hour or two of daylight left, and after building a brush lean-to and throwing down and opening their packs, they started upstream. The country was very dense and hard to travel through, as there was much down timber, although here and there the somber woodland was broken by small glades of mountain grass. At dusk they again reached camp. The glade in which it was pitched was not many yards wide, the tall, close-set pines and firs rising round it like a wall. On one side was a little stream beyond which rose the steep mountain slope, covered with the unbroken growth of evergreen forest. 
They were surprised to find that during their absence, something, apparently a bear, had visited camp and had rummaged about among their things, scattering the contents of their packs and in sheer wantonness destroying their lean-to. The footprints of the beast were quite plain, but at first they paid no particular heed to them, busying themselves with rebuilding the lean-to, laying out their beds and stores and lighting the fire. While Bowman was making ready supper, it being already dark, his companion began to examine the tracks more closely, and soon took a brand from the fire to follow them up, where the intruder had walked along a game trail after leaving the camp. When the brand flickered out, he returned and took another, repeating his inspection of the footprints very closely. Coming back to the fire, he stood by it a minute or two, peering out into the darkness, and suddenly remarked, Bauman, that bear has been walking on two legs. Bauman laughed at this, but his partner insisted that he was right, and upon again examining the tracks with a torch, they certainly did seem to be made by but two paws or feet. However, it was too dark to make sure. After discussing whether the footprints could possibly be those of a human being, and coming to the conclusion that they could not be, the two men rolled up in their blankets and went to sleep under the lean-to. At midnight, Bauman was awakened by some noise and sat up in his blankets. As he did so, his nostrils were struck by a strong, wild beast odor, and he caught the loom of a great body in the darkness at the mouth of the lean-to. Grasping his rifle, he fired at the vague, threatening shadow, but must have missed, for immediately afterwards he heard the smashing of the underwood as the thing, whatever it was, rushed off into the impenetrable blackness of the forest and the night. After this, the two men slept but little, sitting up by the rekindled fire, but they heard nothing more. In the morning, they started out to look at the few traps they had set the previous evening and put out new ones. By an unspoken agreement, they kept together all day and returned to camp towards evening. On nearing it, they saw, hardly to their astonishment, that the lean-to had again been torn down. The visitor of the preceding day had returned, and in wanton malice had tossed about their camp kit and bedding and destroyed the shanty. The ground was marked up by its tracks, and on leaving the camp it had gone along the soft earth by the brook. The footprints were as plain as if on snow, and after a careful scrutiny of the trail, it certainly did seem as if, whatever the thing was, it had walked off on but two legs. The men, thoroughly uneasy, gathered a great heap of dead logs and kept up a roaring fire throughout the night, one or the other sitting on guard most of the time. About midnight, the thing came down through the forest opposite, across the brook, and stayed there on the hillside for nearly an hour. They could hear the branches crackle as it moved about, and several times it uttered a harsh, grating, long-drawn moan, a peculiar, sinister sound. Yet it did not venture near the fire. In the morning, the two trappers, after discussing the strange events of the last 36 hours, decided that they would shoulder their packs and leave the valley that afternoon. They were the more ready to do this because in spite of seeing a good deal of game sign, they had caught very little fur. However, it was necessary first to go along the line of their traps and gather them, and this they started out to do. All the morning they kept together, picking up trap after trap, each one empty. On first leaving camp, they had the disagreeable sensation of being followed. In the dense spruce thickets, they occasionally heard a branch snap after they had passed, and now and then there were slight rustling noises among the small pines to one side of them. At noon they were back within a couple of miles of camp. In the high, bright sunlight, their fears seemed absurd to the two armed men, accustomed as they were through long years of lonely wandering in the wilderness to face every kind of danger from man, brute, or element. There were still three beaver traps to collect from a little pond in a wide ravine nearby. Bauman volunteered to gather these and bring them in, while his companion went ahead to camp and made ready the packs. On reaching the pond, Bauman found three beavers in the traps, 
one of which had been pulled loose and carried into a beaver house. He took several hours in securing and preparing the beaver, and when he started homewards he marked with some uneasiness how low the sun was getting. As he hurried toward camp under the tall trees, the silence and desolation of the forest waited on him. His feet made no sound on the pine needles and the slanting sun rays, striking through among the straight trunks made a gray twilight in which objects at a distance glimmered indistinctly. There was nothing to break the gloomy stillness which, when there is no breeze, always broods over these somber, primeval forests. At last he came to the edge of the little glade where the camp lay, and shouted as he approached it, but got no answer. The campfire had gone out, though the thin blue smoke was still curling upwards. Near it lay the packs, wrapped and arranged. At first Bauman could see nobody, nor did he receive an answer to his call. Stepping forward, he again shouted, and as he did so, his eye fell on the body of his friend, stretched beside the trunk of a great fallen spruce. Rushing towards it, the horrified trapper found that the body was still warm, but that the neck was broken, while there were four great fang marks in the throat. The footprints of the unknown beast creature printed deep in the soft soil told the whole story. The unfortunate man, having finished his packing, had sat down on the spruce log with his face to the fire and his back to the dense woods to wait for his companion. While thus waiting, his monstrous assailant, which must have been lurking in the woods, waiting for a chance to catch one of the adventurers unprepared, came silently up from behind, walking with long, noiseless steps and seemingly still on two legs. Evidently unheard, it reached the man and broke his neck by wrenching his head back with its forepaws while it buried its teeth in his throat. It had not eaten the body, but apparently had romped and gambolled around it in uncouth, ferocious glee, occasionally rolling over and over it, and then had fled back into the soundless depths of the woods. Bauman, Utterly unnerved and believing that the creature with which he had to deal was something either half-human or half-devil, some great goblin beast, abandoned everything but his rifle and struck off at speed down the pass, not halting until he reached the beaver meadows where the hobbled ponies were still grazing. Mounting, he rode onwards through the night until beyond reach of pursuit. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there. <laughs>